Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. Thank you for taking part in this, uh, taking a little time out of your day in the afternoon here. And uh, welcome to our long-awaited security working group uh, launch. We're really, really happy about this um, and to have you with us. We've, we've kind of delayed it a few times with pandemic and the RSA summit moving, and uh, we're really, really excited. So we've got a great day for you. We're gonna be kicking off here in a minute with Kevin Cox, um, but we're gonna have a couple of panels we're going to have a, a, a tech talk with one of our uh, security partners, another panel. And while we're doing this, there's going to be a lot of time for questions. We want to make this, um, you know, we want to make this as interactive as possible. We'll cover each of the working groups. Uh, it's on our website now, but we'll go through each of the working groups we've decided to uh, decided to have at this point. And uh, keep in mind that as needs of the government come up, we may switch into some different working groups as time goes on. But uh, I also want to thank um, Alessia Bugella, Robin Newton, and the rest of the contract security team. They, are, they, they helped us out uh, in the launch of this, and we'll be hearing from uh, Jeff in a little bit. But uh, without further ado, we have a great keynote in mind here. Uh, Kevin Cox, who's the program manager of the CDM program. Uh, Kevin, how are we doing? Good, Tom. How about yourself? Good, good, good. I know that a lot of the topics that we are, you know, going to try to address with the security group, a lot of them came from you and your team and uh, excited to hear where the program has grown so much and move forward. And, and uh, thank you for coming today and giving us an update and kind of setting the tone for our security working group. You bet. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate uh, the invitation and uh, it's been good working with you and, and your team. Uh, so I have about 15 minutes here. I just wanted to, uh, to Tom's point, give you some uh, background in terms of where we currently are with CDM and where we're headed. Uh, rather than just go through uh, where we are like with asset management, identity and access management, et cetera, I want to dive into something that I think is going to be a, a key issue for us as well as for all the agencies in terms of once you deploy tools like what CDM is deploying, uh, essentially continuous monitoring type tools that give you a, a better understanding of what your environment looks like. You create a lot of data, and, and at the end of the day, you want to make sure that that data is as useful and as valuable to your organization uh, in terms of helping protect it as possible. So we can go to the, the first slide uh, here. There we go. The key for us is that we've worked now for about four years with different agencies to deploy tools in many different ways. The first two, as many of you uh, may be familiar, is getting tools on the ground to help agencies better understand the things that are connected to their on-prem network, all the servers, laptops, et cetera. Uh, we also have been working with agencies to deploy identity and access management capabilities to help them understand who their credentialed users are, as well as privileged users. The idea is once you have these pools in place, you've got data coming out of those sensors and scanners. You feed that data up to a data integration layer uh, where you normalize the data, standardize it, and then report it into an agency dashboard that provides the agency's object level views of what their environment looks like. We at the federal level then summarize that data from the agency dashboard up to a federal dashboard that federal leadership can use to, to get a better handle of what the overall federal uh, landscape looks like in terms of total number of assets, different vulnerabilities when a critical vulnerability hits, uh, where uh, is it located amongst the different agency networks, et cetera. So then the, the, the place where we are now is after those four years, we're working with the agencies to operationalize that data. We're also helping fill any remaining gaps so they get a complete view, but with the tools that are already out there, we want to pull the data up and, and make it as usable. So to do that, we, we can't just assume the data is coming in uh, correctly, that, 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 that the timing down at the sensor level is the same as what we'll see in the agency dashboard. So we have to work with the agencies. We have to work with our system integrator partners to make sure that that data that we see in the dashboard, both at the agency level for the agencies and we at the federal level, matches up with a, a reality closer to what the folks on the ground are seeing, and it, it provides a comprehensive view of the enterprise. And so that's where we're at with our data quality management initiative. This is something that kicked off uh, back in the fall. 
terms of developing the approach. Uh, we finalized the data quality management plan in May, uh, have briefed it out to the agencies, briefed it out with all of our system integrators, and are now in the process of implementing it. The key here is there's an a, a approach, a rubric that we use to help identify those critical data points that we have to make sure. We call them the, the critical uh, data elements, and that, those are the ones that you see in the red and the green. At the end of the day, we need to make sure that each of those critical elements or each agency gets too green. And if there's anything that remains red, we have to get that fixed uh, in order to get it green before we can say that the data really has quality. There are other, other data elements that are not as critical, but they have enough criticality that we can't ignore them. And so those are the elements that are represented in the yellow and blue. At the end of the day, uh, we want to uh, get all of those, or we want to get 50% of those elements up to the blue. And so, Again, if, if we aren't at 50%, even if we're green across the critical elements, we need to work with the agencies and integrators to at least get to the 50% level on the non-critical. That's our approach. And, and then the, we get more granular, of course, in terms of what those specific data elements are. But this is the process we're following right now, working agency to agency to make sure that we assess the data at their sensor level, scanner level, working with the system integrators, making sure that data is getting up in a timely fashion to the agency dashboard, up to the federal dashboard, so that we, we can then certify it, uh, can then say this data is operational, we can start to, the agencies can start to utilize it in their security operation centers, in their uh, business reporting, et cetera, uh, and then we can start to get a better sense of what the federal landscape looks like. Uh, and so that's just a, a, a key element that uh, I, I want to, update you in terms of where we, the CDM program, are, but also something that many of you are already aware of and things that you may be working at with the agencies is, is making sure that whether it's through CDM or through other tools like a, a SIM solution or a SOAR solution, your data has to be uh, of quality in terms of matching up with what's coming out on the ground uh, to be able to utilize it. Now that this is kicked off, this is going to be something that we continue in perpetuity in the program. Uh, we always need to ensure that the quality remains, and so we're working with our system integrators to ensure that once we do certify an agency that they remain certified thereafter. One final piece I'll add here is that once we operationalize the data, that's where we can start to turn on things like the AWARE algorithm, uh, the agency-wide adaptive risk enumeration algorithm, which is really a security posture algorithm uh, initially uh, helping get a better handle of how agencies are doing with their vulnerability management, configuration management, et cetera. Once we can operationalize that, we can then start to mature it out to really help become more of a risk management algorithm uh, that will help agencies uh, really start to be able to uh, automate a lot of that manual reporting that they've had to do with FISMA. That's a multi-year effort, uh, but it's operationalization of the data is the, the first key step. We'll go on to the next slide. So I talked about AWARE, uh, what we've been doing there, working with uh, our partners within CSD as well as with the agencies. We have uh, set up two Tiger teams we've had with the agencies. The first one was to help with the agencies develop a concept of operations for how AWARE works. Uh, we also are now working with the Tiger team for the agencies in terms of with the CDM tools, helping agencies get a better understanding of their threat attack surface, helping them reduce that, and helping, like I said, develop a, a, more, a more mature algorithm that will help really start to uh, enable things like ongoing assessment of, of security controls and ultimately the kind of the, the holy grail here is to get ongoing authorization in place where we no longer have to manually assess each of our systems every three years. Rather, we can use near real-time tools and in some cases real-time tools uh, to help show that our, our systems are secure. So that's that's uh, a key piece of AWARE. Uh, like I said, initially the current version is a security posture algorithm based on things like the IPOST algorithm at state, the security posture dashboard at the DOJ, um, and then uh, be able to mature that over the years. Next slide. So some of the things I've talked to uh, Tom and his team about in terms of where we're headed with the program. Uh, Many of you may be aware that we are moving to a more scalable, higher performing kind of big data platform. Uh, originally, we had deployed RSA Archer. Uh, it's a 
good tool, but in terms of the data we're dealing with, we needed something at a, a higher big data level. So we're in the process of working with agencies to deploy Elasticsearch. Uh, that's the new CDM agency dashboard as well as federal dashboard. Uh, I talked about the data quality initiative and AWARE. Uh, and then the four key areas of CDM, asset management, identity and access management, network security management, and data protection management. We're helping fill the gaps in the first two uh, in terms of asset management and identity and access management. And we started uh, working with agencies uh, with network security management, things like cloud security models, uh, doing some pilots, uh, working with SBA, working with NIST on some different things, uh, but also continuing to partner with our TIC uh, 3.0 team, the National Cybersecurity Protection System, and Einstein uh, to see, uh, to, to help develop uh, a model based on industry best practice to secure agency data out in the cloud. And what that agency data is, of course, is our citizens' data, so we, we need to protect it. The final piece is the data protection management effort. We have pilots underway for getting additional data protections in place for high-value assets at uh, USAID uh, on a number of systems and working with a number of other agencies as well on that. Uh, finally, uh, we worked with HR uh, a lot in the past uh, on mobile uh, uh, kind of direction uh, through the Mobile Technology Tiger Team and, and uh, the Mobile Working Group now, the Federal Mobile Working Group, working with Vincent Sridipan and others uh, to help determine the right way forward. Initially, what we want to do as we move into 21 is uh, integrate the agency enterprise mobility management systems into the CDM dashboards so that it's Agencies have a better understanding of all the mobile devices they have in their enterprise. And then, based on uh, the findings of the Federal Mobile Working Group, as well as the work that they've done with ATAR, uh, really uh, determine the right uh, protections uh, that we want to get in place, uh, mobile threat management tied into the EMM, for example, uh, to better protect data uh, on uh, mobile devices as, as the workforce uh, continues to be, become more mobile. Uh, over time. And finally, uh, with cloud security, uh, we will continue to conduct uh, both pilots but also some deployment of things like CASBs uh, where, where possible, getting in uh, to work with the agency as they architect out a cloud security solution uh, so that we can then help uh, support that as they start to, and this is where the TIC 3.0 team comes in and, and the National Cyber, uh, Cyber Security Protection System comes in. Uh, so that we can get the right uh, visibility, uh, data uh, is out in the cloud as users are accessing that data. We know that that data is, number one, there in the cloud. Number two, that it, we know who's accessing it. Uh, and number three, we know uh, the, the behaviors around that data, how it's uh, managed day to day by the CSP, how it's accessed by the approved users and where there's attempts by uh, unauthorized users to access it that we're aware of it. So all of those things we want to help ensure that the agencies have, have the awareness on. Uh, tied into some of that, that uh, network security management work is also potential pilots with zero trust architectures. Uh, so helping as agencies do go, go out to the cloud more engineering and architecting things in a way that supports zero trust. A key element of zero trust is also identity and access management making sure that the agencies have the right um, uh, access mechanisms in place uh, and, and uh, authorization mechanisms in place to ensure that only the, the approved users can get access to the data and that they can monitor in that, that more micro uh, architecture tied to zero trust. So that's kind of the way forward for CDM. A lot of this is going to be in terms of what we can do depend upon budget. Uh, so we'll see where the budget uh, head over the next few years, but this kind of just lays the groundwork and, and some of the things that, that Tom uh, and team are going to work with this working group on uh, tied to a lot of these elements. And then the final slide, I think it's the final. Let me see here. Yeah, so there's our contact information. If anyone does have any questions, feel free to reach out and, and we can get you more information. And with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but I'll hand it back to Tom uh, at this yeah. time. Kevin, um, I've got one for you. Is it what have you learned from this pandemic? How has it changed your game plan? Is uh, I know agency needs have changed a little bit or been refocused. What what's, what are your interesting takes 
in regards to this pandemic and how it's affected this your program? Well, from my perspective, before I came over to uh, DHS and CISA, I was at Department of Justice. And I remember back uh, probably around like 2013, 2014, bird flu and, and a lot of the pandemic uh, prep that, that we were doing at Justice. And I know that a lot of other agencies were doing as well, that uh, that preparation has gone a long way uh, to enabling the, the work of government to continue in, in these new circumstances. Uh, what I was expecting when the pandemic started and, and we went out into a remote uh, footing and, and the agencies did as well, was that we in the CDM program would experience a lot more disruptions, um, uh, initially at least. But what, what was really positive to see is that the agencies, almost from the start, uh, hit the ground running. Uh, they were able to uh, keep systems up and running. They were able to keep the day-to-day -day work that they already had underway with some, some adjustments moving forward. And as a result of the agencies being able to do that, we in the CDM program and, and broadly uh, in CISA have been able to support the agencies in, in the work we are, we're already doing with them. Uh, so that's been a real, real positive uh, outcome uh, as I see it. Uh, the other thing is that we need to uh, continue to be prepared uh, that this could be our uh, footing for, for some time to come. So yeah. we want to, where appropriate and where funding allows, if, if agencies now have discovered new gaps that they have because they have more traffic coming from remote work or they, they have some new, newly identified vulnerabilities, that we help fill any of those gaps, fill any of those holes so that the adversary can exploit uh, remote work, for example, uh, to, to do some uh, malicious things on the network or steal data, et cetera. So that's, that's something that we continue to look at and work with uh, a number of our teams in CISA to see, uh, and with the agencies to see where, where they might need some additional support there. So that's, that's been a key focus for us as well. Great, great. I think, I think we got another one here that, that, that would be relevant. Uh, you mentioned you work with FDA. Does CDM have a role to play in CISA's efforts to protect COVID-19 vaccine research. And, you know, this is one project. I, I know you all have some kind of critical critical list of different systems, and maybe you can go into that a little bit. Yeah, so I'll talk more broadly to start at the CISA level. CISA is deeply engaged with all of the agencies that really have a, a lead on the COVID-19 response. Uh, so that, that ranges from uh, the different operational divisions at HHS, working with Small Business Administration uh, in the distribution of, of loans, for example, to small businesses, wanting to make sure that all of these important mission areas uh, that are at the forefront of the response to COVID uh, are properly protected. We know uh, definitively that our adversaries are, are working to exploit uh, these areas. And as you had indicated, even like the vaccine research that's been in the news in the past few days, that the, 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 the intelligence is showing that adversaries are going for that. So, to the extent that we are working with the agencies in that space, which we are, uh, we're helping to ensure they they have a better understanding of what their networks look like, everything that's connected. Uh, if if they don't have a visit, if they don't know what's on their network, they can't protect it. So that's that's one of the key things that CDM has helped the agencies be able to do over the years. Same with users. If they don't know who their users are and whether they're authorized or not, then they, they can't take the appropriate action. So that's the other a key area that we continue to work with agencies. And to the extent that they have things in the cloud, uh, helping them make sure that they have the proper security protections, both with our program, 6.3.0, uh, Einstein, the cloud service providers, et cetera, uh, to, to really ensure that, that they've got the right protections in place. And, and then as we move in more into data protection management, these, these high-value assets, which uh, there is a, uh, a list that each agency has identified their high-value assets and then grouped accordingly as like the most critical and then the, the mid-tier and, and next tier, uh, that, that we start to get additional uh, protections around the data so that, number one, the system is protected as much as possible, but should there be a compromise on the system, that even if an adversary gets the data, they can't do anything with it. And so that, that's one of the uh, additional things that we are looking to do more and more with the agencies. Great, great. Well, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. 
and uh, stay you safe. Bet. Thank you for joining us. You bet. Thanks, Don. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Uh -huh. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, we can the next panel get off mute, and while you're doing that, get off mute and let's see your video. Um, there's Steve. We're getting everybody on. I would like to cover briefly what is a working group uh, in, in some of the categories. Uh, Kirsten, if you don't mind putting that slide up about the working group launch before we dive into this. Okay, we're getting everybody on. Vincent, I think I saw you were trying to get on. You just got on right now. Kevin was singing your praises. Uh, Kirsten, can we see that slide, please? The working group launch slide? Great. Uh, anyway, what's a working group? So this is our fifth working group that we've launched. We, we call it, ATARC's kind of broken out into the five pillars. You know, we have, um, you know, artificial intelligence. We have, uh, we have mobile digital. We have, you know, uh, cloud and infrastructure. And this is our really last group. Um, and we've been, like I said before, we've been delaying it a few times. So some of the some of the categories you hear live in other groups too, and that's okay. It's a cross cutter. Uh, Kevin uh, talked about mobile threat man management. That group has actually been up for a while, and uh, we're looking to expand that group. But uh, it, it it'll live in security and, and in mobile, Internet of Things. That's another cross cutter. Um, some of these uh, are new. We haven't done blockchain. Uh, we had identity management. It was more mobile focused, but we want to broaden that out. Zero trust is new. The compliance and risk management is new. Uh, security operations, social awareness is new. Um, mobile threat management, as I said before, is in mobile and in Internet of Things. MBSC data model, that's new. Incident detection response is new. And then quantum is new. And quantum is going to be a cross cutter, but we think that the main application probably is initially is around security. And uh, so we're really excited uh, about quantum. That's a recent addition. So um, the way it works with our working groups is we have a leadership call once a week. Um, each of the project teams meet um, maybe once a week, sometimes every other week. We have government leads and all these, which we'll get into later. It's up on our website. And uh, we, we, we lined up the government. You have to have the government uh, participation to begin with. So we've got uh, a lot of the leads are going to be speaking today, this afternoon, and uh, let, it, let you know what's going on in each of these groups. And then at the end of this, we'll, uh, you know, hopefully you'll make a decision. Hey, I want to be part of this. Uh, and uh, it's like one of these things. You can participate as much or as little as you have as you want. Sometimes I call them lurkers. They just want to. They just want to see it. They want to hear it. They want to gather information. Um, others like to want to take more of a leadership role. But we have anybody. You can have your level of participation any any uh, any way you can, especially when you're in the government. And um, once you're in a group, you can go into cloud. There's there's some some uh, you know we it's ATAR's grown and sprawled out, but we're trying to keep it as is as simple and logical as, as possible. And that was uh, why we created those five pillars. So um, without further ado, I will introduce the panel. We have with us uh, Chris Brown, long, uh, who's been with us a while. And we'll, uh, Chris is uh, Deputy Chief Information Security Officer at the uh, NRC. Uh, and she's in charge of the uh, Compliance and Risk Management Project team. She's also on the ATARC board. Uh, we have with us um, Ken Garofalo, uh, founding partner and CEO of Block Relations Blockchain Project Team, and he's like uh, going to be our consultant chair. Uh, welcome, Ken. And uh, we also have David Lang, who's actually on a webinar. Was that last week? Okay, I, I lose track of time in pandemic, but he's the technical director at, at the U.S. Navy, um, the MBSC Data Model Project Team, which he'll go into uh, we also have Vincent Sridapan, and Vincent, you are you're in Kentucky, I believe, right? There, he, there he is. Do we have your audio, Vincent? Okay, good. I just want to make sure. And uh, uh, Vincent is the Mobile Security R and D Program Manager, DHS and T, and then he's on the Mobile Threat Management Project Team, and he's really been working with Kevin 
on uh, the mobility uh, piece of CDM for a while. He's been in mobility uh, for years. He's done a lot of studies that have been impactful in the world of uh, mobility. Uh, we also are lucky enough, another board member, Steve Vetter, who's the federal strategist of Cisco, Zero Trust, and he's running the Zero Trust proje project team. Thank good to see you, Steve. And um, I think we're good. So um, I will start off with you, Chris, uh, maybe introduce yourself, talk about what you're doing on in your day job, and now your other job, what you're tr with, the, with the security project team. Um, what your the security working group what what you're planning on doing with this with your group so um, my focus really in my day job is security compliance I've got um, information security officers that work for me as well as um, uh, folks that run cybersecurity training for the uh, agency role based as well as uh, mandatory annual training and um, we do all of the assessments for new systems and uh, major changes that come up uh, for systems. We create standards. So anything that comes out of NIST, usually awaiting 853 Rev 5, right? Uh, so we can take a look at what standards that we need to do in our organization. But, um, you know, I think that what's, most of that, what I just said is pretty commonplace, but um, I think worth talking about is where we are, and Kevin talked about it in terms of being where we are today, perhaps a little bit longer than we all thought we'd be. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to tackle uh, in security and compliance space is uh, how to handle all of the information that's out at all of these thousands of nodes, right? We used to have a perimeter and we had a few people that teleworked on either your periodic or regular basis. And, and you know, then when this first kicked off, that, that footprint just blew up. And um, we used to allow people through um, a process, the ability to print. And when, of course, this blew up, um, you know, we had thousands of people saying, hey, I need to print, I need to print. And then, you know, you get into um, uh, Sunsea compliance requirements, right? And CUI has been on the horizon for a while. It's got some stricter uh, compliance um, requirements. And so we're trying to take a look at where we are today um, and make decisions now to support the workforce um, without making our lives more difficult when we transition to CUI. And so we're doing an entire review of our print policy um, and of course, using other tools for monitoring um, what gets sent outside the agency. Uh, and of course, that got a little more complicated because we used to monitor a pipe um, and we had to increase bandwidth in order to allow uh, greater usage for telework, but also for patching for our, our endpoints. Um, and we lost the ability to really monitor what was going out in terms of um, in terms of volume uh, for stuff that's sent outside the agency. And so we've had some people that have said, well, you won't allow me to print. I can get around that, right? So uh, we've had to increase our tools and our monitoring of that. And so we're doing an entire review of um, that whole landscape and how we can support people in the best way that we can, um, you know, provide ways that they can control that information should they need to print it. And then, um, you know, making sure that we're we're looking forward to the the compliance that we have to uh, meet in the future. So I think that what I just talked about again is probably relevant to a lot of other agencies. Great, great. And where do you see where in this group do you think we could? Where do you think a deliverable could end up? And in, in once we start working on it, where do you think so, that would what what would a deliverable look like? So you know, in terms of CUI. We're all grappling with um, the requirements for that and what those uh, words on the page mean in terms of how we control that data. Um, do, do the words on the page mean that we have to, if we print something, lock it up in a cabinet? Or does it mean that we can, if we're back in the buildings, rely on that perimeter security, the guns, guards, and gates, right, to control that information within that container. I think that 
we could collectively talk about um, how we comply with CUI and help voice that back to the, the, the people that are sitting on the CUI groups within our agencies. Great, great. Um, Vincent, uh, we'll have you next. I think you're on mute. There you go. I think, Vincent, we're having a little problem with your audio. Is it your phone on mute or something? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, we can't hear you. Maybe maybe you can log in again and I'll get to you in a minute. Okay. Yep. I, we don't have your audio. Now there. better? Is that? That's better. Okay. I switched the, the audio, the mic, I guess, input. So I have two. So the camera or the... Don't worry about it. You know what? Compared to what I did the other day, I I I was like, uh, it was like about three minutes of dead time while I was on mute, and um, you know what are you gonna do? So compared to to compared to me, you're you're in good, you're still in good shape. Okay, so um, so mobile threat management in the project team. So I definitely the things that we do, at least um, from DHS and co-chairing the federal mobility group and all the other agencies, uh, we try to align what the government interests are across you know, federal government to what industry can partner and help us on. So the topic of mobile threat management, mobile threat defense is a topic area. You see it's newly defined um, in things like NIST 800-124, REV2, right, uh, of which you know, others and, and myself and others have co-authored that. But we actually talk about the need for, for mobile threat defense, right, and understanding things like um, EMM, mobile threat defense, and mobile app vetting. In the mobile threat management space, um, we are pushing, and, and you're seeing this on the roadmap, as you probably heard Kevin talk about uh, with CDM and these types of uh, uh, areas where we actually want to put endpoint protection uh, on the device. So beyond just uh, enterprise mobility management, formerly known as mobile device manager, right? you, you want to do more than just configure and set policy on the phone. You actually want to look for threats, you know, endpoint protection, AV, um, different like mobile phishing protection capabilities, those types of things. So um, what we look to do, and, and one of the papers that um, the group is looking at, uh, we actually have folks like uh, Dave Harris from Department of Interior. He works on updating things like the FISMA mobile metrics. So if any department or agency is you know, happy or upset about uh, the mobile metrics, it's usually this group and led by, by Dave Harris that does that. Uh, what we've looked at is the project team and, and sort of under the leadership of myself and some others um, are, are looking to put a white paper together. Um, to actually justify the need for mobile threat defense, right? So when you talk about mobile threat management, um, you want to get that sense from industry, sort of what they can and cannot do. But um, this goes in along the lines of how do we ensure the security posture of our mobile devices and, and you know, protect our backend enterprise. So that's, that's the first key thing I'll note. Um, it also dovetails quite uh, nicely into one of the areas that we're going to look into in the future, which is on international travel guidance, right? So if you, for example, are going, uh, you know, to an embassy, right, uh, in, in non-U.S. soil in this case, or you're going to go overseas, or maybe you have folks stationed at the border that go back and forth all the time, or maybe, you know, a variety of, of use cases that you can apply for, which is an SES going overseas. Um, you know, what are the policies associated? What are the capabilities, technical, right? Um, you know, what are the software solutions, hardware solutions do we need to have in place? So this dovetails really nicely into the mobile threat management uh, space for us. Um, but we are looking at that because whether you talk to DHS, you talk to, you know, uh, another agency like State Department, DOD or others, you're gonna find uh, international travel guidance differing quite quite severely. So why can some people take their phone and why some people can't? Um, do we need to use burner phones or not? Right. Um, I think um, this is just a you know more I guess personal opinion that things like mobile threat management, mobile threat defense are a, a critical tool that can be leveraged as part of a, a you know a, a def defense in depth or a layered defense approach um, that you can use to protect your your mobile asset and also your enterprise. So that's pretty much where we're at for the, the team. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, some of these agencies have moved to BYOD in a rapid fashion. And um, while that's good, that opens up some uh, new security risk if, you, if you're downloading some, you know, Chinese app, um, for instance. So I think that's, that's even more relevant now as a lot of these 
agencies are dealing with different folks. So, and also maybe you could touch a little bit about your 5G efforts. I mean, you've got your hands in a lot of, lot of security pots. Yeah, so, um, so, I mean, from speaking from DHS science and technology side of the house, I can tell you we had a BAA or, you know, it's a broad agency announcement in a secure, resilient mobile network infrastructure. Um, that did go out last year. Um, it closed and we are doing, uh, we, we've done reviews and we're going through contract negotiations now. So I can't say a lot except for the fact that, you know, we look to unveil that at the end of the fiscal year. Um, all of our R&D efforts is very much in line with supporting CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. So whether you're talking about secure voice like FOUO or CUI, voice and data transmission, um, you know, whether that's in 4G, 5G, you talk about um, a variety of uh, cybersecurity awareness capabilities that we're, we're looking there. But, um, you know, the, the topics are, are there is what I would say, and I can't talk too much about it. But what I would say from a federal mobility group, not just uh, DHS S&T, but um, as a whole, you can see the, the national strategy to secure 5G, right, efforts, uh, the actual implementation plan that goes with it. A uh, federal mobility group is supporting uh, those efforts and we've we've looked at and we will publish um, what we're looking to do hopefully this uh, fall, which is a, a 5G testbed framework, uh, looking at covering everything from 5G government use cases to uh, actual, uh, you know, mapping that to capabilities and different types of testing, understanding the testing assets that are out there. So that hopefully should be public. It'll, it'll be a, a, a Fed CIO council document or FMG document. Um, but in the 5G space, there's a lot going on. Money being spent, um, a lot of activities, as you'll see in the implementation plan. But um, we, we are trying to help coordinate, and I would say herd the cats a little bit, uh, because there's so many people doing so many things. Um, but, you know, with the efforts that National Security Council, National Economic Council look to push those efforts, um, that is a, that is a, a, a tough effort, right? Um, trying to make that happen uh, to ensure U.S. prosperity in the 5G space. It's been uh, the top of the the newspaper lately, um, 5G. So, and I think we've learned in the pandemic how important it's going to be moving forward to get high-speed internet access out to remote areas and, uh, and how important that is. So, good stuff, Vincent. It's always good to, your group has always got something going on there. So, uh, next up, we'll do uh, Mr. David Lang from the Navy. Uh, if you want to talk a little bit about yourself and what you're working on and then uh, what you want to get out of the group. So uh, I'll, I'll leave the myself part fairly short. Uh, I'm a, a Navy guy. Uh, I've been a Navy civilian for about nine years uh, working for the Nav War SISCOM. It used to be Spay War SISCOM. And uh, my areas have been uh, a lot of security and networking. But uh, right now I'm moving into a new position as a technical liaison for networking and communications here in the Washington DC area. So uh, yeah, I've heard other people talk about, you know, their teams, now my people work for them. Uh, exactly, nobody works for me. Uh, I am uh, one of those privileged people that get to be in a, a good paying job where I don't have to be a supervisor. And uh, my job is to bring people together like uh, Naval X and some of the other kind of think tanks uh, we work actually a lot with maker smiths and other folks like that to bring together a lot of uh, incubators and thinking people to to look at our problems. One of the big things that I've been involved with, mainly because uh, my former boss was the, the head of it, is model-based systems engineering. And that's one of the things that uh, I was pushing, and I'm very glad to see ATAR you know, starting a group on that. I hope I, we find some interesting, interested people because MBSE, is, is a great topic. It's kind of like ITIL, you know, it's one of these things you can use it for a lot of stuff. But what we use it for in the Navy is a lot of engineering for uh, weapon systems, ships, uh, networks, things that uh, you have to be careful how you do model based systems engineering, because it can be a great tool. And at the same time, it can be a liability if you're not careful with the data you put in there. And that was kind of my first point with MBSC and one of the things I'd like to see the group look at is you have to have enough information, enough data in a model to make it useful. But especially in the case of defense industry, there's a tipping point where you have too much information and, and the model becomes so sensitive that it can't be used by the engineers that need to model things. And that's especially true when you're looking at platforms like warships and uh, command and communications platforms. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of interaction and systems of systems linkages 
to uh, start to get into some very highly classified information. And uh, unfortunately, not all our engineers have top level clearances. So we have to have to have a model that's useful that the engineers can work with, but it doesn't have so much data that it's so sensitive that you have to lock it up in a vault every night and only six people can see it because that doesn't make it very useful as a model. So in, in saying that, the, the next trick is, okay, we got to figure out how much information to go in the model, which means we have to define the scope of the model. And I know some of the leadership, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but some of the leadership wants a, a dashboard that shows them everything. And they can say, okay, show me how this connects to that and where this goes and where that goes and you know, what satellites are supporting this ship. And that's all great. But if you actually had a model that did all that in one place, again, it would be so sensitive you wouldn't be able to use it. So we've got to kind of group these models in areas where they're useful to the engineers, uh, where they can work on them. And then at some higher level, we'll find a way to kind of knit them together. But having you know one grand unified theory model that, that shows you the whole Navy, uh, like some people would like to have, is, is probably one thing technically difficult, but doable. But the other thing is just, a, it, it would be too sensitive to use for anything. And uh, like others here, I've done some risk management and that, that's what I look at every time I look at a model is, okay, what information can I get from this model that I can't get from a paper document? And that kind of goes into the, the next uh, issue about models and model security is our whole security system in the government is based on artifacts. It's based on a document, a picture, a formula, a program. And these are, these are static things that don't change. When you're talking about a systems engineering model, you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of connections that are all referenced to each other. They have you know, referential integrity if you're a database person. So if you change one thing, it propagates through the whole model, which means if I take all the information in a bunch of documents and I put it in this model, that model becomes more than that information because now I can query that model. I can't query a paper document, but I can query a model that has that data in it. And I can look at, a, say, a model of a warship, and I can say, okay, show me a single point of failure using this specific part. And you know what? It will. <laughs> and it'll show you right where that failure is on the ship. And that's a great thing if you're an engineer looking to isolate failures. Not a great thing if you're an adversary wanting to know which button to push to stop a ship. So we have to be careful and kind of change our thinking in how we classify models. Because a, a dynamic environment is completely different than the static environment that our classification system is, is really designed for. So those are a couple of the things that I would like to see the, the group work on and, uh, and think about. It's really, it's a thought problem more than anything. Technically we can do it, but we need to think about how we want to do it. Yeah, I could definitely see the value. First of all, I really like it easy because you know, you see that in movies. You know, I got to move the fleet here. I've got to do all these changes. I, I could get unlimited access to any data inside the, you know, in your case, the Navy. But that's, that's, you know, if it was that easy, um, it's easy in the movies anyway. Well, it's easy so. in the movies and it, it looks, looks great. It looks great to live. They'd love to be able to sit with their, their dashboard on their desk and see the whole Navy and all the interactions. But again, that's, you compile all that information then you have a, an information security problem. Right, right. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, next we'll go with uh, Mr. Steve Vetter with Cisco. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you're trying to accomplish with the Zero Trust uh, project team? Absolutely, Tom. Thanks. Uh, obviously, Zero Trust is one of the hottest things going around. I've been involved in looking at Zero Trust related things back before it was even known as Zero Trust by the turn of the century. Things like defensive information warfare, uh, things like critical infrastructure protection. So I'm retired naval intelligence and we didn't trust anybody back then. And now Zero Trust gives us an architecture and an approach to do that. I've been actively involved with the NIST in terms of you know, 207, their cybersecurity, their Zero Trust Summit, as well as some of the special pro projects that are going on. And I'm actively involved in the ACT IAC efforts. So we expect to bring a lot. I have the pleasure of working with Royce Allen. She's our government lead for this particular project. Uh, as you may know, she's the VA uh, Enterprise Security Architect, and Royce is really excited about looking at this from an enterprise point of view, enterprise perspective of how does this lead to network management and modernization. 
In addition, we were talking yesterday about how can the projects be more effective in terms of helping our government be and implement zero trust. So where to start? You know, what investments have you made in that area? Our IDAM could be one area, identity credential access management. What about modular approaches? So whether it's a guide or a white paper, something to develop out of that. In addition, how do you implement that? Lots of different ways and approaches within an architectural construct. So again, when we bring the team together, we're gonna to be talking through with the members of what is gonna be most beneficial to the federal government to be able to do that. And one of the things that both of us would really love to address is what is the realm of the possible relative to zero trust? We talk about individual stovepipes of different pieces of zero trust, but when you bring it all together, I mean, I think that's really what Kevin was talking about earlier when he was talking about operationalizing the data that's coming from that environment. So the zero trust architecture and approach is gonna enable you to be able to implement and react to that data in real time with machine learning and artificial intelligence driving that so that you really can manage risk at machine speed. So Royce is excited. She's sorry she couldn't be here for that, but uh, we're excited about the Zero Trust project and looking forward to kicking it off. Yeah, I, I met with Royce and I love what the VA, because it really reflects everything in the federal government, but it really brings it close to home. I mean, all those medical devices and, and security issues and these some of these devices are old, they're connected to the internet. And um, I know that's a it's a big issue and you're lucky to have her have her as a chair and and also steve i think that this group will it'll it'll spend some time in some other groups too so one of kirsten's uh you know kirsten's things is just kind of sharing this information with the rest of the groups i think will be will definitely be key yeah thank we're looking you forward and to uh, working with the rest of the groups yep 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 good stuff and uh, we'll go with uh kenneth next with B block relations Absolutely, and thank you for having me, Tom, and hello to all the panel. Look forward to working with you. So Block Relations is a full service marketing, PR, and consultancy firm. Uh, we offer services such as social media account management, uh, educational courses. Educational courses is actually a big part of what we offer because we want to sort of bridge the gap between enterprise and blockchain technology as well as the government as well uh, and industry. So we see education as a core pillar uh, of bridging that gap. We also offer analytics reporting, marketing content, video creation, press releases, written articles, community building, event hosting, event placement, impact campaign creation, and reputational campaign creation as well. And eventually once uh, the COVID-19 situation allows for it, we'll be offering on-site training as well. Um, so a big part of what we've been doing over the past few months is just building out our syndication network of partners to basically fill any knowledge or work performance gaps that we may have as a company internally we want to partner with experts in their respective fields so that they can bring to the table a predefined partnership uh, to service our clients in a more holistic approach. Um, so I do have a document that I wanted to share on the screen here. Tom, is that all right? It's a quick five to 10 minute PDF. Uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted, it would be great to kind of see where your picture of the group should go. Um, exactly. I think that would be, would be, go ahead. Okay, let me do the screen share here. So before we lead into the picture of the group, this is sort of an outline, a little bit of overview, a little educational content, and then it leads to where the direction of the group should be. So how is encryption most commonly used in the blockchain? So encryption is an old technique. It's been around since we'll say the Julius Caesar days where they used, uh, instead of an A, they would use two letters over. So a C would represent an A. And then to de decrypt that, you're basically reversing the encryption method and a cipher is considered an algorithm performing the encryption or decryption. Uh, usually well-defined set of steps that can be followed. So with blockchain, public key cryptography is most often used for encrypting messages between two people or two company, uh, computers in a secure way. Anyone can use someone's public key, which is publicly visible, to encrypt the message. But once encrypted, the only way to decrypt this message is by the corresponding private key associated with that public key. So for example, Alice uses Bob's public key to encrypt the message. This message cannot be seen by anyone else, so it needs to be ensured that uh, it doesn't get out, right? So Alex sends the encrypted message to Bob. Let's say a third party intercepts it. All they would see would be random numbers and letters. The only way to see what the message actually says is Bob has to use his private key to decrypt the read message and read the message. It's important to note if anyone intercepts Bob's private key, they would be able to decrypt this message. So next, hashing. What is cryptographic hashing? So cryptographic hashing is another fundamental piece of blockchain technology. 
and is directly responsible for producing immutability, one of blockchain's most important features. So hashing is a computer science term. It means taking an input of strings at any length and producing a fixed length output. So it doesn't matter if your input is say 300 or 1000 characters, the output will always be the same length. So this is deterministic. No matter how many times you give the function a specific input, it will always have the same output. It's irreversible. So it is impossible to determine an input from the output of a function. And it's collision resistant. No two inputs can ever have the same output. So the most widespread use for the cryptographic hash function is password storage. So most websites you see do not store raw passwords. They actually store this hash of your password and simply check if the hash matches when you enter it on the given site. So if a hacker breaks into their say centralized database, they will only have access to these irreversible password hashes. So it's a way to uh, further protect the security of uh, data that should be. So this occurs within the blockchain as well. So every new block of data, a block is, we'll say within Bitcoin's instance, a block is a 10 minute segment of transactions. Every new block of data contains a hash output of all the data in the previous block. So getting into what is blockchain? Blockchain is a series of these blocks that have records of data and hash functions with timestamps time stamps so that the data cannot be changed or tampered with. With the copies of data in all users' hands, the overall database remains safe, even if some users are hacked. This gets into the decentralized nature of blockchain. So blockchain transactions are also secured by cryptography. So each transaction is signed with a private key and can be further verified with a public key. So let's get into some use cases. So blockchain can be a use case as an alternative uh, to cloud, traditional cloud or server-based companies. It's a strong alternative. So since blockchain technology is decentralized by nature, as we already went over, there's no one central point of control. So for instance, if one computer that's within the network uh, is compromised, it will not compromise the data's immutability. So uh, blockchain utilizes innovative consensus protocols across a network of nodes to validate transactions and record data in a manner that's incorruptible. So leading us into where the group should be headed here. So blockchain-based messaging apps have seen a rise over the past year or two here. Uh, an example of some of them can be seen here on the screen, Dust, Because Communication Matters, Status, uh, these are just some of the more popular ones. I want to focus in on BCM, because communication matters. So an example being of why some of them want to use these kind of messaging apps. So ISIS, for example, was using Telegram and WhatsApp to distribute propaganda related to their uh, nefarious uh, terrorist activities. So those are centrally controlled organizations. They banned ISIS and the bots affiliated with their accounts from operating on those platforms. So ISIS had to seek alternative means of communication. With this app, because communication matters, they're able to have supergroups as large as 100,000, and there's no way to backdoor, trace, or track the kind of information that's being shared within these groups. So that leads us to the working group. One, do we need to create a blockchain-based messaging app for internal government use? And two, how should we begin monitoring and tracing the activity that occurs within these public blockchain-based messaging apps. Well, the good thing is a lot of these messaging apps actually have wallets associated with them. So there is crypto, uh, cryptocurrency transactions coming out of these wallets for these accounts. So cryptocurrency transactions on a public blockchain can be traced. And so we could theoretically trace activity coming out of these wallets and try to identify if they're associated with any predetermined, uh, say, terrorist accounts, label them, and then follow the activity of that transaction as it goes downstream and then take appropriate action thereof. So those are the two ways I see us moving uh, with this working group, creating a blockchain-based messaging app for government internal use, and then creating some sort of tracing product uh, to track uh, cryptocurrency movements and transactions. Okay, I think uh, one thing, um, we definitely probably need to take a little bit of a step back that I think with this group, um, you know, to, to look at some maybe some use cases I know one of the things that we did uh, with one of the government agencies is we are working on a blockchain lab so they can take their specific use case and try to adapt it um, for blockchain. But I, I think that's a good start. But I think we, we probably need to look at some government use cases, get some government involvement. And I think that would probably be a, a good place to start um, with their use cases and uh, you know, what is a block, good blockchain use case? You know, I think, one of, I think I would look at this group and say, hey, what are some really good government blockchain use cases? And if we can find a government agency um, 
that has a great use case, then we, we can go in and see how we can bring the best and the brightest to try to help them pilot in, in some kind of small way. I think that's, that's, you know, one thing we can look at. We'll, 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 um, we'll, uh, we'll definitely talk offline. I think you've got some good ideas there, but I think getting that government sponsorship is, is key and, and maybe even taking a step back and what are our government use cases. But I think, I think we got some good, interesting stuff there on blockchain. Cause I think that, this is one of those technologies, kind of like what Vincent's done with mobility, where the government can take the lead. You know, government can take the lead in this and get ahead of get ahead of things. What Vincent has done with the Federal Mobility Group, as it's now called, is they're the Pied Piper of security throughout the industry. It all kind of starts with the federal government. So I think if we can kind of maybe do a healthcare, um, financial, get some maybe four or five good use cases and really work it to death and and and. Uh, you know, maybe on law enforcement would be a good one, you know, in, in justice, but let's go get a couple of great use cases. And, you know, we got to find the appropriate government champion and now we can drive that to ground. And now we have this great use case. And, uh, you know, I think with Steve, with his chair there, um, you know, healthcare is a good place to start on, on zero trust because there's a need right now. Uh, so I think that that's, that's always what I've, you know, found when when we when we do the when we've done these things, I think the mobility group is, and uh, you know that's been around the longest. We've been on that the longest, and we've learned a lot lot of lessons. And and maybe Vincent, I want to introduce uh, Jeff because he's on and he's going to be speaking in a few minutes. And um, Jeff, I didn't want to leave you out there. Sorry, there's this Hollywood Squares. I can't see everybody, and I I sometimes screw things up. But I I just want to let you know we hadn't forgotten you. Oh, fantastic. Um, can I just give a quick introduction? Yeah, give a quick introduction. I, I'll get back to your talk. We're going to finish up this panel first, but I want to, yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself. Get, and, uh, you know, you this know, is fantastic what, to learn about the, security. It's fantastic to learn about the various working groups within security at uh, ATARC. You know, I've been doing security for almost 30 years. Uh, 20 years ago, I got into application security and I focused there for the bulk of my career. And I don't wanna give away that, you know, I'm doing a 10 minute uh, talk in just a few minutes, but uh, I did wanna say that, um, so about 20 years ago, I spent a lot of time going around to government agencies and talking to them about the importance of application security. Because at that time, you know, there was very early e-gov initiatives and uh, people were moving things online and uh, there was quite a lot of risk being created. But I got a lot of doors slammed in my face because uh, agencies weren't very interested. Frankly, I got the answer, uh, you know, hey, that, that might be a real thing, but we're working on the SANS top 20 at that time. And I went home and I thought about it. And, uh, you know, I had been involved in starting OWASP uh, and building up that organization around AppSec. And uh, I said, you know, what we need is a top 10 of our own. And I went home and I wrote the OWASP top 10 and it became a standard in application security and you know it's been very widely used over the last uh, you know yeah. 18 years now but uh i'll say i don't think the situation has changed that very much very much in government and you know the fact that there's no working group on software assurance or application security in atrc is a little concerning to me i think it's uh you know really critical area i think many government agencies are turning themselves into software at a really rapid rate and that the opportunity for massive risk to government and citizens alike is uh, really substantial. So, uh, you know, I encourage ATAR to, uh, to put a team, get a team focused on government software assurance and, you know, build that community and do better because most of the agencies I talk with are light years be behind where the financial industry is and where the healthcare industry is. And uh, that, that needs to change. It has to change. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put yeah. a pin in that and uh, come back to this in a minute when I do my talk. Well, I think, I think, you know, what, what Gartner, just from having to work with Gartner, you've got like different types of application security, like, you know, Vincent concentrates on mobile, but you also have in the development side, we have a DevOps working group. There's some security being done there. I think it's like kind of pulling it all together. And that's why we, we do a working group. So you can talk about all kinds of security and how this, how this all works together. Um, yeah, please ask your questions. Um, 
we uh, we've got one the identity management group we have I'll get you the answer to that in a second um, one one thing uh, I would like to have is I think that one of the things that Vincent has done with the and he didn't start it but he he definitely has, has the history there almost right from the beginning as I recall Vincent but what, what he's we have the federal mobility group that is an official sanctioned uh, body in the way it kind of well why don't you talk about that relationship because I think that all the groups should really look toward how do I how do I have the official government group and how do I bring ATARC into it but I think that Vincent you'd probably do the best it's good to the best job on that about how it how it works on a day-to-day -day basis and then everybody else can kind of think how that could apply to them doing the same kind of methodology you've done sure so um and, and i can talk about the software here and stuff too we, we did mobile app vetting and partnered with nsa on a project recently for for the automated app protection profile so lots of lots of stuff there if you want to talk offline but um, as far as um, sort of the way we operate in uh, specifically Federal Mobility Group, it is chartered under the Fed CIO Council. Our executive sponsor now is uh, Nicholas Ward, the DOJ CISO. So um, that is uh, provided to us, whether volunteer, voluntold, or however you want to call it. Um, uh, we, we do get an executive sponsor. Uh, before, it was uh, Ms. Renee Wynn, the NASA CIO. Um, but really... We're, we're here really to, to work on common challenges, right? Uh, workable solutions, sharing best practices, and it's really just all volunteer, right? So different uh, folks, whether, you know, we started way back in the mobile technology tiger team days where um, it was a part of the digital government strategy in 2012, 2013. Um, but those groups and other efforts, like we talk about category management and OMB 16-20, um, we found that there's a common set of folks, right? Uh, dealing with um, security, dealing with acquisition, now dealing with 5G. Um, and then we, we made another pillar for these strategic pillars for mission enablement where we share information. But in each of those, uh, we have different leads, right? Giving opportunities for people to, to lead, but also work on things they're already going to work on. And where we sort of, um, federal government's doing X, Y, and Z, whether it's in 5G, whether it's in, you know, FISMA metrics, whatever you want to call it. Um, we try to figure out, well, where's the right place for industry to engage? Um, and, and we leverage folks like ATARC, uh, in this case, like a nonprofit, so that, you know, we have a common place where we can say, hey, just, you know, we're not picking any favorites, right? But we want to know, is this, what's the latest and greatest? Or, you know, how can we understand, you know, what's happening in, in 5G and 6G? And, and, you know, we're getting those briefings from the, the OEMs, the carriers and others. Um, with, with ATARC and others, you know, when we did FISMA as an example, right? FISMA mobile metrics in FY20 and now FY21. I mean, we see that not only the evolution, but um, it's it's partly a sanity check, right? Um, is federal government and, and others trying, and even security practitioners saying, hey, we want to do X, Y, and Z, but the reality is it doesn't exist, not even in a product. So why are you going to ask for it? Uh, we, we use that uh, that leverage uh, with with uh, ATARC, and we try to be vendor agnostic, right? We don't we don't want to promote a specific vendor, but we understand the, the need for things like in the past uh, enterprise mobility management. That's that's a normal thing nowadays. But things like mobile threat defense or mobile application vetting, or even PIV drive credentials, as we go down that route. There's only so many agencies that actually have pulled it off successfully, but in uh, FY21, as we look at it, that's going to be a mandatory metric that's going to be scored, right? Before it wasn't a scored metric, now it is. And so people are starting to pay attention and we want to know what are the, the, the architecture, what are the builds, the compilation from industry, so that at, that is successful for agencies uh, to protect their the access, identity credential access management uh, for their enterprise. So. Now, that's great, Vincent. I, I think your group has definitely been a model and uh, you know, for Steve, for instance, I remember Sylvia Byrne, she's at the FDIC now. She was uh, she was over at uh, Department of Interior and she was in charge of the Zero Trust Working Group on the CIO Council. I think that when you are attached to a body, um, it, it helps with the credibility and it's great for getting the government customers, you know, the gov our government customers um, to, you know, kind of really harmonize what we're trying to do. That's why we went to Kevin and said, hey, what are you working on? What does it make sense to have, have a group? Because you want to have what the federal government is working on. And uh, it saves everybody a lot of cycles and they can leverage ATARC 
because ATARC's not just industry. ATARC is the government and industry and academia. And uh, I think it, we're like a force multiplier to these efforts that are kind of volunteer or you get drafted to do, or, you know, you have a day job. So I, I think there's some yeah. good opportunities. But, but building on um, that, Tom. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, building on that, I mean, NIST has been so focused on zero trust for about the last nine months. So we've got great government interaction with industry and what they're doing. Federal CIO Council has reached out to act, act twice to come up with white papers and focus on how zero trust is playing. So I think that there is a great potential for ATAR to serve in that same role, but now to take it a little bit further with an ongoing group integrated with government across the security group itself and see how zero trust plays into the projects. And, and one thing, I, it, it's kind of where our working groups are going. And I call them working group because that means you're actually producing something. <laughs> we want to have deliverables along the way. We want to have action. One of the big things, and we have a, a, a it's in the cloud and the infrastructure group, but really it should be some, somewhat in the security group. We're using it as a model. But we have a TIC 3.0 lab. And we're working with another part of CISA on that with Sean Connolly. I would love to see us kind of this lab concept of, you know, it's good. It's one thing to come up with a white paper and we've been doing a lot of that, uh, but it's like, I want to see action, you know, like what, how can a, how can an agency come in and kick the tires? So like for our tick 3.0 lab, we're going over those government use cases and working them. You know, we're working them and uh, the, the industry is volunteering their time, the government's volunteering their time. And then hopefully as a result of these pilots that we're doing, that there'll be use cases that the government can leverage. Because, you know, sometimes the government is ahead, you know, wants to be the first ones there, some people, but other people are, hey, let somebody else blaze the trail. I'm going to just, uh, I want to see something work and be pragmatic, really where it's been proven in another agency. So I think we have a lot of cool opportunities this, this uh, year, um, you know, to, to really uh, put some of this stuff to, to work. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited about it. Um, any more questions, any final thoughts? We're kind of running up against it. This, this hour went by, or 55 minutes went by quick. Any, any final thoughts from any, anybody that, that about their groups or, so I'll add that okay. uh, I led a, yeah. an internal working group to deal with uh, international device support and connectivity. And, and Vincent, I made myself a note to follow up with you to share with you what we produce so that you can uh, poke some holes in it as you, as you take this even further. <laughs> I know, it, there's, no, there's no poking holes. It's just a team <laughs> really trying to help enable the department and agency planning. Even, even things like, um, you know, category management, if you have to deal with um, integrated data collection, that's more of an internal yeah. to government. But I mean, we, we updated those metrics or modernized those uh, with the help of Christian Williams from GSA. So in all efforts we do metrics or and otherwise, it's really to help protect the agencies yeah. and their assets. And, and if, you know, we, somebody doesn't know how to do it, then we, we try to get them examples and introduce them to the right people, so. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another thing that Vincent and his team did is they came out with, uh, you know, basically category management. Where can I buy mobile? What contract vehicles are out there that I can buy mobile? Um, you know, mobile and mobile security. So I think that we, we have a category IT management. Uh, we work with the cloud on, on cloud and a lot of different other areas. As a matter of fact, we have uh, Victor coming up and he, he's uh, the security person over at GSA. Uh, how do you buy this stuff is is not something you don't want to don't want to address um, in whatever you're doing. That's like a, a big part of it. And then Kenneth, kind of what you were talking about with your company, but you know, reskilling is another theme. How do I get people educated in this that they can actually implement this technology? Um, we've got a lot of ongoing efforts there. So great. Well, uh, thank you uh, for joining us. It's been a been a good panel, and good luck with your with your launches and uh, we'll get you some, hopefully get you some good volunteers after this and we can get things kicked off in each of your groups. Thank you. Okay, Jeff Williams, hang on. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> nope, right here. Great, great. Um, well, 
thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you to Contrast uh, for making all this possible and being a great partner. And uh, love to hear from you. And uh, what are your thoughts on security? Uh, great. So I've got a few slides. I'm going to go show. I'm going to share my screen here real quick. All right. Okay. Um, so hi everybody. My name is Jeff Williams. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Contrast Security. Uh, we focus on application security. I've specialized in software assurance for uh, almost 20 years. And today I'm going to argue that we should focus on the areas that present the most risk and that as we turn the world into code that software assurance should be at the top of everybody's list so i'd love it please uh think of some questions and ask them in the chat if it comes to you later please don't hesitate to reach out to me on linkedin or twitter my handle's planet level okay so uh application software is transforming everything even faster in the age of COVID, but we're terrible at building secure code. Uh, do you bank online? Do you use doctors? Do you travel? Or, or did you used to travel? <laughs> do you use social media? Do you use government services? Those are the kinds of applications that we're talking about here. And it doesn't even matter if you use the apps, your data is in them anyway. So if we look at the stats, uh, we're in the stone age. Application security is the number one cause of breaches in the deep, in the, uh, Verizon's DBIR, the Data Breach Investigation Report, for like the last eight or nine years. Uh, just about every application has vulnerabilities in both custom code and libraries, over 30 on average. Can you imagine if we were building airplanes and every time we inspected one, we found 30 safety problems? And it's not just the vulnerabilities. The attackers aren't stupid. They know the easiest way into your organizations is through your code. There's 13,000 attacks per month on average per application. So it's, you know, it's really quite a bad combination. If you've got 30 vulnerabilities and 30, uh, 13,000 attacks, uh, that raises the, the likelihood that somebody gets breached pretty seriously. Now, I wrote the OS Top 10 in 2002. In the last 18 years, we've made almost zero progress in AppSec. Applications today have roughly the same number of vulnerabilities they had back then. And what's worse, what's really crazy, it's the same vulnerabilities. We haven't eliminated a single class of vulnerabilities in that time. So you know, why is application security so hard? Well, you got to understand the scale of this problem. So the average application has about a million lines of code. And I want you to imagine that uh, it's a legal contract. Imagine if we printed that out, it would be about as tall as Golden State Warriors superstar Clay Thompson. And imagine it's a legal contract and you're a lawyer and your job is to go through all that, that legal language and find any loopholes. It would be really hard. It would take you probably you know, more than a few days to go through that. Uh, and by the way, if you add libraries and all the open source code that are part, part of applications, then it's as tall as the whole starting lineup. That's a big contract. And many agencies have thousands of these applications. So if you imagine that out, imagine it's uh, a pile of code that's 75% of the way to the International Space Station. It's stupefying. That's just one organization. Uh, all that code is changing constantly. Developers are cranking out new pages of contracts every single day to make this problem more difficult. So it's quite daunting what we have to achieve. And I want to, I want to just zoom out on the problem here is the whole point of IT is to deliver value to customers faster. Doing security the traditional way involves lots of experts. Every time you change code, you, you have to run scanners like SAST and DAST and SCA tools. That's the legacy approach to this problem. Those tools are noisy. And so you can see as these tools throw off lots of findings, some of which are real, a lot of which are false positives, you have to have experts involved. And there's not nearly enough experts to accomplish this job at the scale and speed that we need. So it ends up creating a huge security backlog and lots of bottlenecks that slow down innovation. And ultimately it leaves a lot of risk on the table. So many organizations have these complex rich risk management processes. 
they've bought into this dangerous fallacy that underfunded security efforts plus risk management are about as good as properly funded security efforts. Essentially, they're saying the structured inadequacy is almost as good as adequate security. And that's not the case. In order to solve this problem, we've got to get experts off the critical path of delivering value to customers. Otherwise, we end up with just this trickle of business value getting out the door and everybody's frustrated. Or, you know, teams bypass this process and deliver tons of risk. But it doesn't have to be this way. We've got to fix the, in order to fix this picture, we've got to change the economics. So let's put a pin in that for a second. And let me tell you about the magic of instrumentation. So this is the 9450. It's an instrumented basketball. So it's got sensors in it that detect your dribble speed and your shot rotation and the arc of your shot, makes and misses and a bunch of other stuff. It's got an app on the phone that tells you, you know, it's got all these drills and metrics that you can review. Now I've been playing basketball for a really long time. And after one hour, the ball told me that my shots were not, didn't have enough arc. So I made an adjustment and it improved my game dramatically. This is a whole different way to think about building a basketball team because player and coach can now work together much more efficiently. And all it took were a few sensors inside the basketball. So I want you to imagine this for security as we change the relationship between security expert and developer. We've got to empower the developers with better security information. So the old way of doing security, scanning of firewalls, these tools were pretty inaccurate. So it's tough to empower developers with the feedback from those tools. But today we can use security instrumentation to do security much closer to the thing that we're trying to secure. So it's not just the application layer. I'll talk about IAST and RASP in just a second, but it's at all the layers of the stack. Instrumentation means we can do security from the inside out as opposed to this old outside in kind of approach. And that's more accurate. More accuracy means we can get experts off the critical path, which means more speed and more scalability. And in a lot of ways, this is a zero trust kind of architecture as we were just talking about. This is an approach to empowering the components that you use with the security that they need. So let me tell you about IAST and RASP. So IAST is simply, it stands for Interactive Application Security Testing. And it simply means that you're using instrumentation to detect vulnerabilities in your custom code, in your applications, and your libraries. Uh, essentially, the way it works is it instruments your application like a profiler. And then as you do your normal job, without any changes to the way you build, test, or deploy your code, the IAST is in the background looking for patterns of code execution that represent vulnerabilities, and then reporting them with a ton of detail very accurately. So it's a different approach. It's not scanning, it's continuous monitoring for assurance purposes. So that's IAST, and you use that during development to build better code. RASP stands for Runtime Application Self-Protection, and it just means that you're using instrumentation to detect application layer attacks and prevent vulnerabilities from being exploited in custom code. So it's similar to IAST, but instead it's designed for use in production. And the same kinds of sensors detect attacks very accurately from inside the application where they can be really you know, fast and accurate and prevent your applications from being exploited and give you that visibility into who's attacking you, how they're attacking you, and which systems are being targeted. So let's take a look at how you can use IAST and RASP today. I should say uh, requirements for IAST and RASP have both been added to NIST 853, the latest revision that's uh, due to come out any day now. So RASP is, uh, and, and IAST are both, uh, you know, well understood, well adopted technologies, and it's time for you to build them into your, into your programs. So I wanted to give you a different picture of how modern security can work. And here the idea is, instead of going through layers and layers of scanning and expert review, we can use instrumentation to test the whole fully assembled application stack. We can directly measure security from the app itself. And then, uh, and that's totally automated. So there's no change to the code or the processes. You just do your normal job, but the instrumentation's in the background, detecting vulnerabilities, looking for attacks. And 
this can give you instant feedback directly back to the developers on where their code's vulnerable. So it's very different than getting a scan report, you know, two weeks later, two months later, two years later, that says there's vulnerabilities. Instead, you've got a, a feedback loop that takes about a second. And so developers can treat security the same way they treat all the other kinds of bugs that they encounter. They get feedback right in their IDE, uh, right through their tracking tools, right through uh, you know, JIRA and uh, you know, fail their builds and so on. And then that, that process continues through the pipeline. So as they go through CICD and test stages, they're, they're continuously checking for vulnerabilities. When they get to production, they're watching for attacks. All that feedback comes back instantly into their process. This allows you to produce value to customers and security at really high rates of speed. Because you know, I think we could all agree that doing security as far left in the process as we can is the most efficient way to do it. So instrumentation, I asked in RASP, can power that. And really, that's the essence of DevSecOps, is, is now we've used the power of instrumentation to, to inform the security development and operations teams. We fix the broken economics of software security so that we can achieve this, this flow. And so ultimately, I want to convey a message of hope. Uh, application security isn't hopeless. I'm not saying though that technology alone can fix the problem. You, to do good application security, you've got to build the right mix of culture and people and process and technology. But security instrumentation can create a platform where development and security can finally work together instead of sort of arguing about what's a false positive and how to track this risk and whether this risk is rated the wrong rating and, and all that. Instead, we can focus on creating really fast remediation so that most vulnerabilities get identified and solved very early in the process. That's the key to delivering secure code into production faster. And ultimately, it's the key to driving innovation in government and enabling better services for folks. So um, I'll stop here. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, now would be a great time to ask. Um, looks like there's a few I in think, the list. Here. I think we have some questions. I think we do have some questions. I, I'll start off. I'll have, I'll take the yeah, prerogative and ask you a few things. Uh, for me, I've always seen like you've had the developers and they look at the security as the other guys that, that try to impede their creativity. And so how many times do you see it? They do the code, it goes over to security. They take a while, then they get back and they, they spit up the code and they say, they say you, you know, you, you know, it's all bad yeah. and you're not going to pass. And how do we yeah, get exactly. that better? I mean, automation is obviously a big thing. I think that's the real crux. You have the creative folks that are trying to develop this great, cool, op, cool thing. How can we start better at it for DevSecOps? Is it sitting them together yeah. in the same room in the beginning? And how would not you recommend that? Just, yeah. So exactly. look, I think, you know, security experts need to take a different role. They have to be coaches and toolsmiths, not, you know, in the, the direct path of value into production. Um, because there's not enough, there's not nearly enough security folks out there to be part of every code uh, delivery, yeah. particularly with DevOps, you know, codes getting delivered, you know, hourly, daily, multiple times. Uh, there's no possible way to get in that. So we've got to figure out ways of automating security and it's gotta be more accurate because you know, we can't rely on security expertise going through each of those findings. So to me, you know, the essence of DevSecOps is about changing security. It's really not about changing development. They've, they've accomplished their mission. They're delivering value to customers much, much faster than ever before. We got to change security yeah. to solve the problems with how we deliver security. And instrumentation is a key tool in the toolbox to make it go faster and, and better. And uh, Vincent Sridapan from DHS has a good, pretty good question. Uh, how do you differentiate your testing between mobile apps, desktop apps, web apps, any difference in your methodology or testing capability? Yeah, and uh, Vincent also asked if I'd share the slides. I'm happy to share these slides. Uh, I'll send them to uh, our, our hosts and uh, they can distribute, but yeah. I'm also happy to, if, if somehow you don't get them, please reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm at Planet Level. You should be able yeah. to find me. So um, we, we will send them out, go ahead. So look, uh, I think it's important to focus on your most critical risks and you know, think about your whole application portfolio and sort of you know, figure out where you're gonna focus because you don't wanna spend time fixing vulnerabilities that don't really create a lot of risk. Uh, so 
uh, probably the best place to focus first is on web apps and web APIs because they're extremely powerful. They have access to all the data and uh, they're you know, easy to exploit for the last 20 years. So uh, you know, that, that's a very common hacker target. Mobile apps uh, are interesting, but much less risk there because it's, it's difficult to target a mobile app and get more than one person's information. Like you can't get all the data out of uh, an organization. So it's important, um, I think, uh, but you know, sort of not as critical as, as web apps and web APIs. Desktop apps and other kinds of rich client uh, things similarly, but ultimately you've got to look at your portfolio and decide what's most risky and where you have to have the, the best levels of security. I think that's what NIST uh, uh, risk management process would, would uh, counsel you to do anyway. But uh, you know, the, nothing in the NIST standards is very application specific. So you have to interpret it and uh, you know, really think about for your business, what would happen if this application got compromised? That's how you figure out what, what's the most risky. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Jeff. And I, I think we, we actually have a DevSecOps in our, in, in our uh, you know, DevOps working group. I think we need to make this one of those cross cutters that's over in both groups. Cause I think, I think, I think that makes a lot of sense that you ought to worry about your applications. It ought to be a focus of this security group on, as a whole. So that was fantastic. And one more note, uh, you know, I can tell that NIST is really caring about this because they moved Ron Ross, one of their best people over here, that is now handling uh, DevOps. So uh, that that's very interesting. So yeah, no, thank you very great. much. For your uh, time, he's a good Jeff. friend of mine and I, I work with yeah. him on DevSecOps uh, all the time. Yeah. I mean, when they, when they moved him over there, um, that was, that was a big indicator that the federal government, this is right, right about the top of the list. Thanks again, Jeff, that was very informative and we will get out his presentation if that's okay with you. Um, and but wait a minute, hang on, we might have one more question. Oh, good. All right, I might've lost it. Okay, well, we'll take that offline. We need to move on to the next thing anyway. Thank, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Enjoy everybody. the rest of your afternoon. Okay, that was Jeff Williams, Contrast Security, great presentation. Very informative, and uh, and I think that we'll have some more further discussions on that. So now we're headed to our second round of panelists. If everybody can get on, unmute, and uh, let's see your video. Your bright and shiny faces. All right, Victor, are you getting on? Now I'm good. <laughs> I was uh, I couldn't do it. <laughs> good, good. I know you got your your great set back there. We had Victor on one of our webinars a little bit ago. So great. Um, Let's introduce our next round of panelists. Um, we've got with us Brian Rosenstiel. Hey, Victor, hey. Florida. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, hi. Hey, Brian. I, I think the last time I saw you was right before pandemic, uh, walking around, was, was it Boston where you live? Uh, well, you, you, I, live in, you live in Arlington, right? Uh, Charlottesville, okay. a little bit farther south. But, but yeah, we, we, oh, met that's in, right. we met in Arlington in a, a very different world. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It was a little bit ago. It seems like about a million years ago, but I guess it wasn't that that long ago. And uh, uh, Mava Gonda, Mava, am I saying your first name right? I just got to get that out of the way. It's probably, I tend to butcher things. How are you doing? Mava, thank you for asking. I'm great. Thank you for inviting me. Great, great. And it's Mava. I didn't my, my sure Ava. I that right. My Ava. My Ava. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's always important not to get the name of your panelists wrong. Um, and then we have with us, uh, Mr. James Saunders. How are you doing today, James? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? 
Good, good, good. Is that that looks like a kind of a cool, comfortable chair back there? I don't know. I, I haven't seen seen that. I've been doing a lot of these. I'm trying to figure out the right chair for myself. Uh, it's a it's a gaming chair. So after I'm done with this and work, I pivot there. to this side and my gaming system set up. I, I was going to say that. I, that's what I thought it was, but you know, I, I just figured. It, what's the difference between playing Fortnite and doing your job at the SBA, right? A uh, big difference. And we also gotcha. have. Well, yeah. Um, and then we also have with us, uh, Steve Vilkas. Hi, Steve. Hey, Tom, how are you? Uh, just really quickly, you need to give, need to stop giving yourself such a hard time about putting yourself on double mute the other day. You know, it's all good. Oh. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah, the worst is, uh, you know, I, I had the mute, you know, you put it on the platform and then yeah. you also put it on your phone because I had to get up and get some lunch and stuff. And I came back and then I was like wondering whatever, nobody seemed to be responding to me talking for about two <laughs> minutes. Um, to the best I do run the that. advanced, <laughs> I do run the advanced technology academic research center. You think I'd be able to figure out the mute proper mute, mute button etiquette. Um, yeah. So great. So uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, maybe uh, please introduce when I introduce you, just introduce yourself, what your day job is, and then uh, the working groups, kind of like what we did the last time. And I am going to start off with you, Maeva. Sure. I'm a scholar, and my focus is quantum technology research. I basically focus on the global perspective in order to make business case cases for investment purposes. And uh, the JQI, at the JQI, I report to a NIST fellow. So we're a government institute. And um, in addition to that, I lead a couple of different groups in, for ATARC, um, a chair for your AI, one of your AR project teams, as well as the quantum group. And I am a chair for IEEE cybersecurity blockchain group for healthcare and life sciences. I'm a chair for the Cloud Security Alliance's blockchain working group and I lead a group of, I lead a global team of cybersecurity, cybersecurity experts basically developing a new framework for best practices for the use of blockchain. That's enough. Yeah, right? we like we like putting you in, in all these hardest, the hardest groups you can come up with and uh, we, we like to throw you in those. So thank you. Thank you very much. What do you think we would, where do you think we could, I mean, quantum is like one of these groups, it's, it's a little bit out there. Where do you think that we might be able to take some first steps uh, as this field is mat maturing? I, I think one of the things we talked about is maybe looking at cybersecurity as a start, if you, you know, to help us focus. Where, where do you think that maybe this, where the, some of the deliverables might, might look like? Sure, or, I agree with that. In that direction. Yeah, I agree with that. And in fact, we have one of our, our next webinar will be focused on cryptography for that purpose. Um, and I've also invited for our NASA event, um, Dr. Eckert, who is well known in the field in cryptography. So yeah, so cybersecurity is certainly a huge focus and it's a key component of my research of the work that I do. Great, and I, I think that that's like kind of how these working groups happen is in the beginning, it's about information gathering and getting all the players together. It's like you're trying to assemble the team. And, um, you know, especially in quantum, it's very early. There's not like a million people that do quantum. So I think one of the, one of the challenges, and, and it's a good challenge, is how do we get all these folks together in the same, 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 um, in the same group? So I'm really excited about this group. And it, it's definitely one of these that's built for the long haul is yeah. quantum is going to be more and more important. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that is the goal. We want to make sure we create a center of excellence that really brings together uh, members from federal government, academia, industry, and it's, it's trending in that direction. Great, great. Um, thank you. And next up, we'll uh, no particular order. So I'm going to go with you, James, over at the SBA. And I know your job, your day job is pretty daggone busy, especially lately. Yeah, so uh, James Thomas, my day job is uh, CISO for the Small Business Administration. Um, so I, I manage that entire uh, security program. And, you know, we primarily focus, focus on making sure, you know, we're able to deliver 
value to the small business community across the nation um, in a secure manner. Um, so that's my day job. It's, it's fun, it's challenging, and um, the adversaries uh, don't make it easy. So uh, I love it. Um, as far as the working group, um, so I'm working with the, the Zero Trust program. Um, so I'm, I'm highly interested in, you know, helping really define what zero trust means. Um, Cause you know, you hear that buzz for a lot and you talk to this person over there, it means something else. And this person over here is something else. How do we come to a, a standard consensus of what it means? So with that, I, I can imagine we're gonna refactor and leverage what other organizations are doing, such as DOD with their reference architecture are gonna pay out shortly. Some of the work that uh, the TIC group has already done and most importantly, I need to make sure uh, we incorporate some of the things, again, from TIC, from DHS, as well as that CDM program and infuse that all together into this is how Zero Trust plays in relation to these other groups. And then since so, you know, part of the SBA, also have to think along the lines, how do we make it accessible for a small business? Um, I know when some people think of Zero Trust, oh, that's only for the big organizations and the the, the, the agencies, but what about that small business down the road? They have IT uh, to a degree. We need to make sure they get some of these same principles as well. Um, so that's generally where um, I'm, I'm thinking uh, as we start building off this capability in these working groups. Well, I, I think James, you brought up a really, you brought up a really good point is take advantage of somebody's already developed something. You know, if somebody already has reference architecture, we're not shy. Let's bring that into our group and and highlight it and and give it some credit and and then you know maybe maybe that uh, we can share that and we don't have to reinvent the wheel every every time we do something in an agency. So I think that's always a good first step to reference the work that's already been done and collect it. So fantastic. Um, how about you, uh, Victor? Absolutely. Um, no particular order, right? <laughs> yeah, I just went with you. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, again, I'm Victor Favito. I'm one of the IT security program leads in GSA. I'm also the chair for the security working group uh, with APARC, uh, which is phenomenal. Uh, the dynamics that we have in those groups. Uh, if any of you would like to participate, we're always looking for people uh, so we can exchange those ideas. Uh, again, some of the white papers and some of the initiatives that we put in place in those working groups are phenomenal. But today, um, we're going to talk about, uh, and, uh, Kirsten, if you can uh, display the slides for me, please. Uh, we're going to go right into the agenda. I'm, I'm not really going to talk. I only have a few slides, so, so don't worry about it. But uh, um, I want to talk to um, to you guys about the, um, especially the third item down uh, on this agenda, which is the established security services uh, process flow. Uh, Tom mentioned hey, where do we get these tools when, we, when he was talking about CDM? Where do we get these services? So I, I'm gonna talk about the, the process flow very quickly. Um, I'm gonna touch some breaches that we have uh, based on the um, Verizon uh, report, uh, some FISMA uh, significant findings and some key takeaways. Uh, so next slide. Uh, again, uh, the security breaches that we have uh, based on the 2020 uh, Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, the VBR, VBIR. Um, for the public administration breaches, uh, in 2019, we have 346 uh, breaches, uh, and that is an increase of 16 incidents from the previous year. I mean, it's a lot, uh, but if you think about it, we're going to get into the money that we're investing, and then you're going to see why uh, we're slowing down uh, these breaches, but um, there is a, a multitude of breaches and almost 40% of them uh, were involved, uh, were the result of the web application attacks. Uh, something to think about it as well. And unlike last year, financial gain are ranked espionage on the principal motivation for cyber crime. So now uh, these people are realizing that we can make a lot of money here. Um, something else that is quite alarming. Um, ironically, the recommendations are pretty well known. You know, we always talk about training, you know, being uh, the users being the weakest link. And once again, that's one of the first recommendations that they make, uh, implement a security awareness and, and, and training program. Uh, amazingly enough, we still have a lot of agencies out there. I wouldn't say a lot of agencies, but some agencies out there still 
need to put a good training program in place, you know, uh, boundary defense, you know, the, no secrets there. And then of course, you know, misconfiguration, how, how to securely configure our devices. So that, again, um, nothing new per se, but what, what the big takeaway here is how we slow in the breaches and how we invest in money. Um, next slide, please. Here you can see what I was talking about when, when it comes down to investment. Uh, we, um, we spent uh, this past year, uh, FY19, 16.9 billion in cybersecurity. Uh, that doesn't include uh, DOD, by the way. Uh, so roughly 12% increase uh, from the previous year, uh, which is 14.9 billion in 2018. Um, again, and, and, and we keep spending money. Uh, so that's, that's the good thing, once again, uh, we've seen them, uh, agencies uh, are getting better, but we need to keep, keep working on it. But, uh, because again, 28,581 agencies reported incidents across nine attack vectors. Uh, that, that number is pretty alarming. Um, DHS has been doing a lot of work. They've been a, an incredible uh, partner uh, with GSA. And then they conducted 71 HVA high value assets uh, assessments resulting in 448 findings. Um, so again, the, the, what we're talking about here is if you, if you put this in perspective, if you compare uh, the spending in 2016, it's been a 52% increase in cybersecurity spending. Uh, think about that. You know, agency, agency incidents data provides an indication that these threats, uh, the, the, the threats that the agencies face every day uh, and the persistence of these this, uh, this incidents, uh, you know, these attacks. Uh, next slide. Um, this is the, the, my, my, the, the slide that I was looking for to show. Uh, very simple, I made it very generic, uh, but for, for the agencies out there that looking for um, these services and these tools, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple process and we do our best uh, to keep the process as simple as possible. Um, so first of all, the agencies have to determine the needs. Uh, we need X, Y, Z, you know, you can, uh, it could be a risk assessment um, just, just for the sake of the argument. Uh, they will contact us. Uh, we have a team of not only uh, contracting um, experts, but we also have a, a full staff of cybersecurity uh, experts uh, in, 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 in different areas that can be the glue uh, between the agency and the contracting uh, staff from GSA. Um, then we will direct you to any of the SANS or any of the contracting vehicles that fit your needs best. Um, when it comes down to cybersecurity, we have over 290 uh, vendors right now uh, on the hacks, on the highly adaptive cybersecurity services. I believe uh, 71, 72% of those are small businesses. Uh, so we have, and, and, and these businesses, small, big, in, in between, uh, they have a, different specialties. Uh, so I'm confident that we can find the best uh, vendor for you so we can fulfill your needs. And then we can also help you with the procurement pro uh, process. You know, we have, once again, we have all the uh, uh, contracting workforce that'll be there for you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the big takeaways. Um, you know, if, if you didn't know, uh, the, um, the federal government have placed more demand on GSA, ITC, you know, IT, um, IT category um, is, is the division that I'm under, to provide uh, direction on, on the procurement process of uh, cybersecurity products and services. Um, so we constantly engage in on that. And that brings me to the second uh, bullet here, where we actively involve in changing the way cybersecurity is addressed in in the acquisition process. Uh, we're really making an effort to simplify the process. We understand that it's, it's, it's difficult, uh, but we have the people uh, available for you. Um, and we would like you guys to see us as a partner and not just an impartial marketplace. Uh, we, we more, you know, we hand to hand with you uh, instead of once again, just a place that you go and get X, Y, Z. Uh, and then we're fully committed uh, uh, for the, uh, cybersecurity workplace 
and ready to help agencies to make sure that we meet your IT security requirements. So that's all I have uh, for the slides. Uh, if you have any questions, um, let me know. Yep, thank you, Victor. Victor's one of these new school uh, government employees in the acquisition business where they actually try to not oversell you on something. Um, I've seen it in action and uh, really IT category management too. I know Victor's one of the one of the folks. I mean, I know he works for GSA, but he'll actually steer you in a different direction if it makes more sense. And there's another vehicle out there that makes more sense. Correct. I think it's definitely a direction that GSA should go. One thing that you said that I thought was uh, since I have James here, we'll just redirect, do a quick redirect over to him is I think you could spend two, you can spend a lot on security, make it very complicated and some of the stuff never gets implemented. And I always thought that uh, old SBA had a good, they got better security by getting simple and spending less money. Um, I don't know, James, do you have any comments on, on that? Um, I kind of did a setup for you. Uh, certainly, uh, see if I can have a turn to serve here. Um, yeah, so our cybersecurity approach from a, a tool perspective, um, first thing we wanted to do is get rid of on-prem tools where it makes sense. So that's less engineers needed to make sure C driver is working or make sure network cable isn't stepped on and broken. Um, so that then transforms operations more into, you know, using cloud-based tools and leveraging those. Then is to simplify one tool for one problem a handful of tools for wherever part of the stack you're in. So instead of having multiple antivirus solutions because one is shiny, the other one is shinier, we just have one that meets all of our needs. Um, and we do that down the entire uh, security uh, architecture or tool stack if you want to look at it from that way. Um, so that's, that's how we simplified and actually got better security. At, at one point we had about 40 or so tools and 20 of those overlapped. Um, so you can imagine the math that happened there. We now have roughly 20 or less tools that have, again, one role or could fill multiple roles. So I, I will say to, to your, your setup here, you know, look at your requirements of what you need, get the tool that uh, meets the requirement, cost effective. Uh, you don't need the latest and greatest, just need the one that meets your mission, implement it 100%, and you should start seeing cost savings out of that while meeting your security requirements. Great, great. So that, sorry to do that distracting thing while I was doing introductions and everybody was talking, but I, I'm very short attention span. I probably would have forgotten if I didn't do it right then. So Brian, sorry about that. I uh, felt like I had to get, get some more discussion there while we we're doing introductions, but uh, uh, thank you for joining us from Charlottesville. Yeah, no worries. No, I, I thought that was an interesting- By the way, I was actually down there this weekend. I went to Charlottesville this weekend. And I uh, went to that brewery there right in town. So I, I love oh, Charlottesville, even though I'm a Hokie. I was in enemy territory down there. Oh, well, they love me down here because I'm a UMBC graduate. So um, we're still remembering <laughs> that game. But uh, yeah, no, so, uh, you know, my name is Brian Rosenstiel. And, you know, I'm on the uh, identity management group, one of the, the co-chairs. Um, and basically a little bit of my background, right? So I, I've been dealing with very various parts of identity within the federal space for over the last decade. You know, and th this includes everything from physical smart cards, uh, you know, think of your PIV and some other X509 cards that are implemented. You know, seeing that transition to, to a virtual realm when we start talking about drive PIV and really, you know, working on, on that initiative. And, you know, now currently, you know, my day job is, is one of the solutions architects with Duo and really looking at the expanded set of NIST Special Publication 863 3 authenticators. And, and this includes some of the alternatives out there as, as we found, you know, uh, PKI working extremely well in some areas, but then we look at other things like a local administrative account. And we know that, you know, the way that Active Directory is, has been implemented and architected you know, our, our physical PIVs may not work there. So we, we have to turn and look to other identity solutions and multi-factor solutions to, to secure those specific areas. And that kind of leads me into where I see identity in the federal space and, and where I see things moving. So the last 10 years really have been built around 
you know, implementing some of the strongest authenticators that we have available to us. You know, we look at the smart card and, and it is a smart authenticator and it is a fantastic tool to have in your arsenal to really help protect, you know, your infrastructures. But one of the things that we need to look at, and this is where identity is moving to, in my opinion, over the next decade, is smarter authentication. And that's different than just having an incredibly strong and smart and sophisticated multi-factor authenticator. The way I liken this is I, uh, I like to refer to something called the Red Queen Hypothesis. It, it's actually something I've borrowed from the, the biological science community. And, you know, and they talk about predator and prey relationships, but I think it works extremely well within the cybersecurity space. And basically it all goes back to the story of Alice in Wonderland. So Alice is running away from the Red Queen uh, and beneath her is actually a chessboard. And as she runs, the ground beneath her is moving just as swiftly as, as she's moving forward. So she actually isn't making any space between her and the Red Queen. But as long as she's running at the same pace as the ground beneath her, she's also not in threat of being overtaken by the Red Queen, you know, wants to go off with her head. And so we look at that within the cybersecurity space of as long as the tools we've implemented themselves are advancing and we have a dynamic way that we are approaching cybersecurity, we should be able to stay ahead of those attackers. And the moment that we rely upon static defenses, that's when we allow ourselves to basically stop running and eventually be overtaken. And so with identity, that's where this concept of smarter authentication lies, right? We wanna move away from just saying, I have a really strong and sophisticated multi-factor authenticator that I've implemented enterprise-wide, I'm good. And this is, this is zero trust in action. From, from the identity space. It's how do I bring in dynamic policies into my identity authentication workflow so that I'm not subjected to some new attack factor that comes down the line? And that's where we need to be looking at identity a little bit differently, implementing it in a, a smarter, more sophisticated way and having it as a part of our authentication practice, a, a policy engine, a workflow that allows us to, to have those types of reactions. And how is pandemic? I know a lot of agencies, they might, they weren't hundred percent telework for, I mean, maybe, maybe GSA and a few others, but now all of a sudden my threat is vector has changed. Um, what have you seen across government? What is, what has really right. been eye opening for you? Um, that you've seen? Because I know you guys have been pretty busy. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I finally got like a breather for a week. Um, <laughs> but uh, we've been running nonstop. So, you know, I'll, I'll give a great example. So there's, um, there's a couple different ways that you can implement a derived credential. One of the ways is in the native key store. Now, again, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of PKI from an authenticator standpoint. It's incredibly strong, very sophisticated. We like to say if you try to brute force those keys, you know, all the stars in the sky will actually burn out before you're able to do so with some of these algorithms. But a question got asked of us, hey, we've got a derived credential in the native key store. That's usually not a problem for me. I've got an EMM and, and you know, I've got GFE devices. So I, I've always inherently trusted my device. However, I now am in, because of the pandemic situation where I want to enable a personal cell phone and put that derived credential in the native key store of that device. But I have no way of actually knowing whether or not I can trust that device. This is where we talk about identity holistically. It's more than just the account you're using. It's more than just the authenticator you're using. It's also the devices that you're coming in from as a part of that authentication. And that's a real challenge. So that, that's where, you know, what we wanna do is see something where in, as a part of the authentication, we can do a device posture Yes, let's augment traditional PKI, traditional PIV, where we are looking at that workstation where that request is coming from and see whether or not that operating system is up to date, whether or not you know, the overall security posture is something that is acceptable. And so I think that's been the most eye-opening experience during the pandemic is just how much inherent trust we, we had in the federal space on our systems and and really the journey that we need to take down as we look towards zero trust as we look towards smart authentication practices and i think we, we've highlighted okay we can't always rely upon being on a trusted network about being on 
a trusted device, yeah. we need to make sure that our, especially from identity, but this goes across all the different pillars within security, that, that we get away with just blind inherent trust and, and have that built in in a meaningful way into our, our security practices. Yeah, I, I think one of the areas, and I'd love to get your take on it is, you know, we have FEMA, we have uh, USDA fighting forest fires, we, we have a disasters, we have pandemic. So we have to authenticate folks that aren't always on our network. I think this is one of those technological problems we haven't exactly solved yet. Um, where are your thoughts on that? I, I would love for this group to kind of look at that use case because it's across government, almost every other ag agency it could be law enforcement. The FBI has to bring on local sheriffs. You can't like put them on your, your EMM. You can't do all these things. They have to use their own phone. Um, you know, how do you know it's them? Um, and how do you unauthenticate them? I, I think that's like one of the bigger use cases that needs solving throughout the federal government. No, I completely agree. And, and we've known this challenge for some time, right? When we look at FIPS 201, and, and the, the physical smart card, we run into situations where, okay, this works for most people, but what happens when I'm overseas? And I need to enable a, a foreign national to have some access on my network. Well, we can't give them a PIV, but we've locked our, our, our networks down to PIVs, right? So we have ourselves a situation where you only rely on that, that authenticator, then what do we do for these maybe small subset, but important subset of, of use cases. So yeah, it, it is something that as we move forward, we, we need a, a more dynamic way of not just everything needs to be just this authenticator. It needs to be, everything needs to be this authentication level. And, you know, to, to NIST credit, when they came out with, you know, 863.3, I think that's, part of what they did when they started splitting out and we, we got away from level of assurance and moving into IAL and AAL and FAL, you know, I think that was the, the first step in, in a good direction of let's look at equivalencies within the very specific pieces that go into that authenticator and that authentication. And then, you know, I'm excited with, with you know, 800, uh, 207, you know, when that comes out, you know, and it gives us more of a zero trust strategy, I think those are going to provide us as pathways so that, you know, if I'm DHS and I'm called in because a hurricane happened and, yeah. you know, I'm using my drones and I need the local sheriff's office to be able to see my feed, what I can tell them is, as long as you have an equivalence that I need for the security of this application and you're coming, you know, that, that equivalence is more than just your authenticator, but it's, Hey, as long as your workstations are, are at least up to this date, your browsers at least up to this date, and I can check those in a dynamic way. I don't have to worry about managing that endpoint. I'm just managing the authentication. That can help. You know, we're, we're a ways off from that, but I, I think we're starting to see that focus align correctly as to, to where things need to be to have swifter enabling. That's why we need this working group to move that along. So yeah, we, we need to get there. And uh, last but not least, we have with us Steve Ilkus, who's the co-founder and director of intelligence of block relations for the blockchain project team. And also uh, one of the chairs for the blockchain uh, project team. Steve, welcome. Thank you. Thanks again, Tom. And um, obviously, you know, I'm a super ATARC fan. And I've been to so many of the previous webinars and I think that speaks to like a lot of um, like how Ken and I got into this. You know, I've, I've identified, I've been taking copious notes here because I'm, I'm also like enjoying this event as well as participating in it. There, for me, there are four key values that have come out of not only the pandemic, but also like, you know, fostering further innovation, fostering further collaboration. That's what it's about. I mean, basically it's all about discovering, it's all about forming connections between groups it's all about getting that collaboration going so that we can arrive at solutions. I mean, Ken and I met a couple of years back when he was the Boston chapter president of a, basically a cryptocurrency club here in Boston. And the way that he was able to, as we saw, I want to give a shout out to Ken, the way that he was able to, you know, demonstrate a use case speaks to the fact that within blockchain, 
you know, there's been a lot of hype over the past couple of years, especially in 2017, as you know, but it's really starting to mature. We're really, the, the market is starting to temper and it's starting to get to a place where, to your point earlier, we need to look seriously at these use cases and where can these use cases possibly be applied for maximum benefit? You know, we're seeing other nations around the world, you know, trying to capitalize on blockchain. And first and foremost, I'm a patriot. And I feel like our country deserves to be, you know, on the bleeding edge, on the leading edge of all that innovation. What I look to like gain from being a part of this working group is further education and further collaboration opportunities. But also what I've witnessed in terms of my pandemic response activities, which I can speak to a little bit, is that when we, when we come together, it's often from a position where we know that we don't know everything, but there are certain things that we do know that we know very well. And we recognize our peers in the space who can complement whatever gaps we may, we may have. And you know, when you talk about a blockchain lab, for instance, that's brilliant. Like that, that's, that was something that's definitely, definitely gonna go a long way. And um, yeah, I mean, basically in terms of pandemic response, when this thing first started, I mean, I come from the startup world as well. A lot of things within the startup scene here in Boston started to shut down by necessity. And people started having to virtualize and remote everything as you know. And all kinds of interesting things started taking place. People started, you know, revisiting topics. They started trying to figure out ways to, you know, still do work even while they're apart. And then there was another blockchain group that started this, um, this messaging initiative where they were seeing a lot of COVID-19 related disinformation, misinformation, and just downright nonsense. And they decided to develop a toolkit to try and um, try and help mitigate that, which I got involved with. So yeah, I've been I've been busy. You know, Block Relations is a fantastic company, but I'm here. You know, like I said, as Kenneth said too, like we want to make sure that this country is doing everything it can to foster blockchain innovation. Yeah, I I, I think that's we're di we're different in other countries. You know, I think we have to bring everybody together. You have to, I, I think, build and I, I, I look at like artificial intelligence, you got to build, you know, so uh, in artificial intelligence, you know, China's, you know, really getting good at uh, mm -hmm. monitoring their people. That's not a great use case for us. Uh, I, I think we, we're, we're one of the, we're, I think that we gradually will come together as a country and come up with some great use cases and some great capabilities. I think with the federal government, we need to bring people together so they can implement technology faster. I think yeah. we're, once we get things rolling, we're pretty good. I mean, look at this pandemic. Uh, we just changed our business overnight. Yeah, we were doing in-person events and now we're all virtual and it seems like, I mean, I, I, I didn't barely know what a Zoom call was. I mean, I was a conference call guy and mm -hmm. every morning now we have a Zoom call and I can't multitask. I, I was probably the worst person on a conference call. I now realize that because I'm like multitasking. I'm doing other things. I'm not paying attention. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then I would wonder why I would say something on my conference call when I'm leading it and people would never respond. They're not paying attention. At least the Zoom makes you pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if I'm like this, what are you, what are you guys thinking? <laughs> you know, I'm, exactly. I, think good though, I think, I, yeah, I think you brought up something really interesting though. So, I think that the federal government will be much more receptive to the idea of exploring blockchain further and ultimately implementing it as a potential solution if we can provide that validity and cut out the noise. And what we've seen specifically with the pandemic, Ken and I have directly observed this, is that you have a lot of specificity. So you have like, for instance, supply chain risk management, you have, and, and rather appropriately, you have cybersecurity, cyber intelligence. I mean, Take, for example, what happened several days ago with the Bitcoin Twitter hack. You know, and now the FBI is getting involved in that because a lot of high profile figures were, were targeted by these Bitcoin scammers and hackers. You know, there are people like Ken and I out there who we, we know how to use blockchain and we love blockchain. But again, we also, we also have very, very strong patriotic feelings. And we know that using our domain expertise and using like, you know, the, the, the communities we've been a part of, we can basically, like Ken said, effectively build a bridge where, you know, like what you've done with ATARC, what we're now doing with ATARC is you start that conversation and you ultimately build that coalition, which leads you to the deliverable because you can't do everything by yourself. I mean, you can try, 
but you probably won't get as far. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, we're running out of time real quick here. So if anybody has any, any questions, please ask them. Um, I want to get everybody about their day. I, one of the things, Steve, you brought up that, that's making me think, what, what are, you know, inside your agencies and, and your working groups, at pandemic, I think the government has just changed things so fast. Um, are, are people more open? How has pandemic affected the, the government workers? Are they going to be more open to innovation, more open to change than maybe they ever were? I would just I mean, like to hear, especially, yeah, what, yeah. What, what, from everybody, really. What, what, are, are we just guessing right now? Uh, it, you know, what is it going to look like in six months? Uh, in, brief, in brief, I can I, I can lead us off and I'll be very brief. So one of the things that I did when I first started with my pandemic response activities, trying to bring people together and forge connections is, I attended Prescott Pollen's Defense Innovation Network's virtual summit series. And sort of like with ATARC, it brought together a lot of people on both sides, public and private. And yes, you know, to, your, to answer you direct, directly, I think that there is a lot, uh, you know, it's starting to warm up. I think people are starting to realize that with the crisis that happened with COVID-19, we need to accelerate thoughtfully, but accelerate nonetheless. Right, anybody else wanna add anything to that? Well, I, I guess think... I'll jump in and agree. Oh, you got it, Brian. No, go ahead, James. All right, so I will say, and this is my opinion, I'm not speaking official inside of the agency or anything like that, but from my perspective, yes, um, agencies at large have become much more innovative, um, embracing much different, different type of technologies, different type of architectures, primarily in order to continue to deliver value to your respective business mission. So you, you can't say, I had to do it this way because NIST or the other federal requirements never said you had to do it this way. It's just the way they got pushed out through the government. But now everything's a little bit more flexible, a little bit more dynamic where Maybe you can telework and still deliver value. Maybe you don't always need to sit there in the office to do so. Or maybe mm -hmm. I should really look into no um, zero trust. So push zero trust. Maybe we do CDM differently. Tick 3L was a big win for being more innovative. So it, the, the foundation, in my opinion, was there. Now we're able to push it because everything's different, everything's new. So why not try something new to see if we get more value out of it? I, I agree. And I was lucky enough to go to your, you did the CDM pilot, you did the tick pilot. You guys have done a lot of really cool stuff. And, you know, Sanjay has got to figure out how to do that tour, you know, in, per, you know, do a virtual thing. Tell everybody about the little tour that you guys give for other government agencies. I was lucky enough to go one day and uh, I think I was accompanied by about 60 federal agencies. Talk about yeah. Sanjay's tour. Yeah. We haven't done one in a little while, um, but in general, what we'd like to do is you know, showcase some of the, the value we got out of, out of modernizing our security tools um, and how we're in place of operations. So in 2018, we did a TIC pilot in collaboration with uh, GSA, OMB, and DHS, and we were able to showcase that you can build TIC-like capabilities uh, directly into your cloud environments without having that traffic redirected back into your, your central MTIP provider and then back out, you can do the same thing straight out. Um, so that's one of the things we show that you, you can see everything that, the, well, nearly everything the TIC requires through that same methodology. You now traffic, uh, to a degree, some uh, SSL decryption, uh, session, so on and so forth. Then last year, we, we did another one with, uh, again, in partnership with DHS, where we was like, we can accomplish uh, DHS, some of the requirements, leveraging, uh, again, cloud native technologies to get the same type of benefit and maybe a little bit more flexibility in how you can manipulate and use that data. So early in 2020, um, we were doing a demo that combined both of those to show this is an alternative to how you can meet those two different program objectives by using these tools, you can see you know, what's in your network, who's in your network, what you're doing, so on and so forth, as well as everything TIC requires. Um, I like to think um, a good chunk of that has made it into DHS, where you know, some of it influenced TIC 3 I believe, and then some of it is influenced in some of the direction that Kevin is leading up, where you know, we're looking at a little bit more flexibility in the CDM program as long as it meets the core mission. 
Yep, really, really cool. Um, okay, anybody else on, on pandemic? We're starting to get some questions. Anybody else want to comment on any changes they've noticed with pandemic? Yeah, I, I think, I think you know, the, the simplest way to put it is the, the genie's out of the bottle. You know, we, we got forced overnight to go to a world that was telework. And the federal government had been trying to figure out how to make telework work for uh, quite some time. And, and, you know, when the reality is when you actually, you know, pull, pull the curtains aside and you, you take a deeper look, um, you'll notice that there are still admins commuting into uh, their offices every day because we still did not have the infrastructure ready and have the tools ready to have everyone at home. And so, you know, there are people who are, are on skeleton crews and are rotating shifts to try to make Teleworks work for the vast majority of employees out there. And I think what has changed, because we, we've seen events in the past that have forced a lot of people to work from home, right? We, we think of major snowstorms, uh, major disruptions due to hurricanes and, and basically, you know, natural disaster based oriented events. Uh, this was something that we all knew was a possibility, but I don't think any of us actually fully had thought out or, or in, uh, none of us really anticipated, you know, obviously there are four thinking individuals who said, hey, this is a vulnerability, but the speed at which this came, it came from, and eh, we might have to shut down to no, shut it down, go home. And then the uncertainty of when we're gonna reopen. In fact, you know, when you look at our company, you know, Duo being a broader part of Cisco, we're still not sure when we're going to allow people to go back into their offices and go to work. Uh, you know, fortunately, yeah. you know, we, we as a company, we're built to be able to provide teleworking. So, you know, it's worked out well for us, but that's not the case across the board. What this has shown is, and, and actually I'm going to try to lead this into a question that I see was, was asked is we need to make sure that every time that we are bringing an application on board or we're bringing network infrastructure on board, we ask ourselves again, what happens if COVID comes back or, or something event like it? Can we manage this remotely? And if we can't, what risk does that put us at? And I, I think that's something that, you know, I, I, at least, you know, for as long as, as hopefully we can manage, uh, that becomes part of the decision making process. Uh, that also goes into making sure that our admins aren't responsible for everything. Because again, you know, we, we have individuals working very, very hard, you know, kind of unsung heroes going into to offices every day to keep those lights running so that most people can be working from home. And we had a question that came in about, you know, because I've been talking about dynamic authentication, dynamic policies, making sure that we have smarter authentication. So a specific question about the importance of identity governance and, and you know, what are my thoughts specifically around um, getting authorization and access decisions closest to business managers and out of the hands of IT. And, and the way that I, I understand that question is, you know, we think about authorization, a lot of that has to do with provisioning of a user's account. And that is pretty heavy work from an administrative individual. Uh, so, you know, we've got large help desks that have been created. We've got uh, administrators who are, are working across many different applications, but may only specialize in, in just one because of the time that it takes. And, you know, it's up to them to make sure that we're not over privileging uh, individuals with their, their access to the various applications. And the unfortunate answer is that they don't do that. They're, they're, the, the IT staffs that we have uh, are too few in resources to make sure that we are only provisioning access at the right level for each individual. And so over provisioning tends to be the, the way to survive. And so I, I, that's kind of my thought on this. We need to make sure that we've got tools in place that enable people at that business management level to say, yes, you know, my, my workforce, these specific individuals need access to this application, but these other individuals don't. And, and to be able to do that in, in a secure manner, and that's not an easy lift, but I think that has to also be a part of our, our conversations around our overall identity strategy. Uh, and and to, to 
do that in an effort to reduce that workload on our administrators. Um, Cause again, you know, we, we don't want a situation where we only have a handful of people that can manage the entire mm -hmm. in environment and access request. Um, and, and what happens when they can't get into the office? Does that, does that mean that, you know, everyone is down? No, that's a great point. And I don't, I don't know if you guys have been catching, but on Capitol Hill, Congress is all over this because they, their citizens are coming back to them, their, their constituents, and I need my government. I need my government to deliver these services. And all these excuses that we've had, or the, I think that they're, they're understanding. And I think that ATARC is going to, you know, we've always worked with the government. We've always worked with academics. We've always worked with the industry. I think we're going to be doing a lot more work with Congress to educate them on, on our needs. And, and I think that we need to really collaborate with them. We're on, we're on the same team. We're on the American people's team. Uh, we need to maybe get funding and not be afraid to ask for funding if we need it. And, and, you know, maybe there's going to be a payback, you know, we're delivering better service to the American citizen in some fashion. So I think that there is a zest throughout the country on this and I've seen it. Uh, I did get, uh, we do have a, uh, Maeva, are you going to show us a slide? I heard Kirsten said that there was a slide you wanted to present and I, we're almost out of time. So I definitely wanted to give you that opportunity. Sure. There we go. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to make sure um, I give everyone an opportunity to speak before I recruited members for our group. But basically we launched last month and these are the deliverables that we're working on right now. So we're planning to have a post quantum cryptography webinar led by Dr. Lily Chen from NIST. We have, uh, I've put together a panel for uh, the NASA HQ event in October. We also need volunteers for the task forces Major Ken is leading for, to basically help with this QIS initiative based on the, the president's executive order to basically work with Congress and our policymakers more. As you mentioned that you'd be working, you'd like to work more with Congress a few minutes ago. So that's one initiative that yeah. is geared towards that effort. Um, Dr. Mark Heiligman from IARPA is driving our QIS taxonomy initiative to help with classification. And um, I've been researching a quantum money paper. I'm sorry, I've been working on a quantum money paper as well as a brief to help with reskilling of veterans uh, based on the new opportunities that will come up. And the quantum money paper was based on just a random search that I did. And I noticed that there are patents out there geared towards cri cryptocurrencies. So with the help of one of our group members, Dr. John Martinez, I'm trying to understand is unhackable money really possible? And so that is a paper that we're trying to publish in the you know, next couple of months here. That's amazing. I was, <laughs> was going to say the same I, thing. I was trying to be funny. I said, let's see if quantum money really does exist. I never imagine I'll find anything. I almost right, I just flew out of my mouth. I just, sorry. So, well, I did. The, <laughs> I had the same reaction. I was like, wait, is this real? <laughs> so I'd and, love to you know anything. Go great. ahead. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, I was going to say, I'd really urge anyone who's interested to please join us. I, uh, yeah, I brought in, I mean, I called Dr. Martinez the army just because he's, I mean, he's got to me what he's accomplished and what he's done for quantum, but his help in trying to understand, you know, what, what the implications are of what's, you know, going on behind the scenes here is tremendous. So anyone who'd like to help with these initiatives, you know, we're happy to have you. Yeah, and it looks like you've already engaged some of the leaders, like IARPA is just this incredible organization. See, basically the intelligence version of DARPA. And right. I, I, I presented there once, and I don't know if there was a different, more different crowd that they were, there were some smart people in there. I, I think you had to be, everybody was a PhD except me in the room. I, I think I could guarantee that one. Um, That's my was, world. Uh, some really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it just, I can't tell you how interesting this, this is. And, and this is going to be absolute game changer stuff 
We know it's early. Um, you know, I think if you're the CTO of your company or, or, or government agency, this is peeking around the corner type of stuff. It's the kind of thing you want to get in early because uh, it's going to be absolutely critical uh, to our the future of our country. So it's a, it's a race we have to we have to win. Uh, uh, and uh, I think there'll just be so many innovations that come out of this, and you know it's going to be it's going to be fun. So. And once again, if you're going to be in a working group, you can be in multiple working groups. So you don't have to be like, oh, I just only, I only don't want to sign up. You know, you know, you don't have to sign up for just quantum. You can sign up for something that may be your day job, but you can do the interesting things too. Um, and I, I think that's that's the way I I used to do it before I started ATARC. I would join some of these groups, and it's like I'd learned so much. So very good. I think we got a good feel for what we're trying to accomplish in, in some of our groups and. Uh, I thank you all for joining us. I think we, that's all the time we have today, but um, looking forward to getting these groups spun out. I think we've got a lot of good mission stuff. And um, Kirsten, I think what I wanna do is maybe go to the website and uh, kind of go over those teams. And I, I think I'm, I've just talked enough. I, I think my voice is got, I'm losing my voice. I think I'm gonna put you on the spot. And if you can work at, Kirsten Patton is our working group manager. She's one of the hardest working people I know, and she's juggling um, all these government people and the industry people. And it's, it's, I think she had like two meetings going on during this webinar, you know, like she's just, you know, keeping herself busy, but I want to give her a little credit. She put all this together. I just show up, you know, I basically work for her now. She just tells me where to go and I go. So Kirsten, maybe you can work, walk us through the working group real quick uh who's the government leads and the and we really don't have we wanted to get the government leads first we have a couple of industry some legacy folks like uh brian and his company but we maybe you can walk us through and share the website are you on kirsten sure yes i'm on can you guys hear me okay yeah okay i'm going to screen share then um i just pulled up the the website so that you guys can see what it looks like. Um, when you go to our working group page, go down to security, you'll see all of the different project teams starting with blockchain. And um, we've heard from most of these panelists today. We also have identity management. We have zero trust. Royce Allen was not on the panel to present today, but she will be one of the government chairs for this team moving forward. Um, compliance and risk management. We heard from Chris Brown on our first panel. William Rogers was unable to participate, but he will also be a working group government chair. Um, security operations and situational awareness led by William Welch with HHS. And of course, we heard from our mobile threat management team with Vincent on the first panel. And these are the other government and industry folks who are already involved in this group. Um, Internet of Things was not represented on this webinar, but it is another cross-cutting team, as Tom mentioned before, that will be incorporated into this specific security working group. Um, MBSE with David Lang from the Navy, who was on our first panel as well, and he has already um, listed out a number of different projects that the team could possibly work on moving forward. So I think at our initial meeting, we'll probably decide which one that the team wants to work on and just continue the meetings from there. And lastly, we have Mike Nicholson from DHS, who will be the government chair of the Incident Detection and Response Project team. So if you're interested in joining any of these, um, these teams, you know, after the, this webinar, uh, please reach out to ATARC or me and we can get you into the meetings moving forward where each, you know, team will work on some sort of deliverable to assist federal government in the security space. Yep, and I think we've also, thank you, Kirsten. I think we've already put, great job. Um, Victor thinks so too, I saw him clapping. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're also gonna kind of move, I think, uh, what is it, uh, DevSecOps in, into here. And for those, we still got a lot of people on the webinar, wow. Uh, if you have any ideas for any other things that we're missing, we're always open to doing it especially if we have a government is interested in something. I think we're covering a lot of things now. It's probably a lot to handle, but if we have anything else, we're always open. Um, you know, we're all, we always open. Um, we got one for data ops. Well, we've got data, we got data and analytics coming, so we might do that. But 
good ones. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think we're excited about this. So everybody on the webinar, we're going to send you information about it. Um, we're going to try to get you, if you're government, we're going to sign you right up. Uh, the industry folks will send you a separate email. I think also if, if my Ava, if anybody doesn't have a problem, we'll share all the slides, uh, if that's okay. So we can get a package out to everybody. Um, and we appreciate your attention and resp uh, in, in, in hanging out here for this. It, it went, a, you can't get, you know, it, yeah, hopefully it went fast, it, you know, but it was, you know, a couple hours out of your afternoon. I think of hopefully it was worth it. Um, and great. And once again, thank you to the panel. Enjoy this. It seemed like, wow, this went by fast. And we appreciate all your efforts here. And we're looking forward to uh, the rest of this year. And then in the 2020, 21, we might actually uh, meet people, see people in person again. <laughs> we're all going to have thank very you all. awkward handshakes when that, that happens. We'll, we'll have forgotten how to do human contact. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I you know, I know, I, I know the last time we met in person, we had the DevOps group working group. I mean, we had the DevOps summit and it was like the Tuesday that was that bad week when we all didn't go into the office on Monday, but we had Tuesday, we had like 300 people there. Wednesday night, President Trump had, this is serious. Thursday morning was like everybody's spouse was at Costco, you know, like at six, you know, or Wal you know, Walmart at six o'clock in the morning. So we, yeah, you know, I miss people in person. I think this Zoom Zoom has been fantastic, but it's like it'll be good to get everybody back in person when everybody can be healthy and you know miss that human contact. All right. Well, everybody have a good afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one. All right. Bye. Thank you. Out. Thank mm -hmm. you.